You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Fascinating story. In the army, army prison, DJ, gay porn star, straight man. Yeah. To then bare knuckle world champion. It's a bit of a roller coaster, Danny boy. Anyway, I bashed him up with this with this iron, and then the light comes on. There's, you know what? I'll never forget it. He was up against the fucking the cupboard like this, just fucking shaking, like spasming sort of thing. And I was like, what have I done it? Because I used to just like, go turn up, to ring someone, and say, "Come on, man, come on, free drugs." And I just have like a, a sorry, like a mug, there filled with like cork, and I would just like grab a spoon and go. Mm. That anyone who come round, like it was, it was yeah, days on end. The, the best thing I ever done, the best thing I've ever done in my life was learning to not give a fuck what other people thought. Yeah. But it is, a, it is a mad thing to think that a straight man doing that. It's mad. You obviously, you've got acting, maybe guys kiss stuff like that. That's understandable. Well, I had to do all but of to that. then go full blown, what was the worst kind of stuff you had to do? The kissing. The kissing. So for the, for the Lucas Entertainment, we had to kiss. Now, I was like, look, I'm not putting a dick in my mouth. Right. <laughs> so there was one guy who I worked with, right, who I got told about three days later that like he was HIV positive, right? Mate, it fucked me up. Big style. In these mad couple of years, I've got quite far. I've only been doing it six years now, so... And I'm BKB world champ, and I've just beat a fucking killer. Easy. Easily beat him as well. Like, if he had won that fight, they were calling me the bare knuckle bummer. <laughs> when we're on up, today's guest, we've got Dan McGraffin. How are you, Dan? I'm good, mate. Good. Thanks for having me on. Good to have you on. Yeah. Fascinating story. In the army, army prison, DJ, gay porn star. Straight man. Yeah. To then bare knuckle world champion. It's a bit of a roller coaster, Danny boy. It is a bit mad, isn't it? It's yeah. a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's your story though. Yeah, it is my story, aye. And people love this mad shit. I know, I, I knew this what I said, manifested this 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 happening. I thought I've got I listened to people's stories before and I thought I've got a better story than this person, mate. I thought my stories, if I if I was listening to my story as a different person, I'd be like, Whoa. You weird cunt. <laughs> Only time will tell, mate. Only time will no, tell. No. First and foremost, how are you? I'm good, mate. I'm good. How are you feeling about doing this interview? I'm a little bit nervous, to be fair. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be all right once we get cracking, yeah, mate. But I was man. coming up and I was dead excited and I was just like, started getting like them pre fight nerves coming in. I was like, you're not fighting, you might come. Mm -hmm. You're just, <laughs> you're just doing an interview yeah. sort of thing. But. As you know, I always go back to the start of my guests. Yeah. Where you grew up and how it all began. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Cumbria as a kid. Grew up in a little town called uh, Maryport in Cumbria. Um, couldn't really tell you much about my childhood there. Like, lived, me mum and I weren't together, but we lived on the same street. Me, me, all my family pretty much lived on that whole street. Um, and then me mum me met an army man. Um, and oh, I think I was about four or five, and we moved to Germany. And uh, so I was a bit of a pad brat. We were moving around a lot, <clears throat> moving around quite a bit. So we lived in Germany for a couple of years. Um, they, I think this was the point where I always thought I'm going to be in the army. I didn't really, I'm, I'm thick as fuck with me, mate. So academically, anyway, I, I, I knew I wouldn't do nothing but the army. So <clears throat> um, we left the army left Germany, sorry, about seven, and moved to Newcastle. So that's where, I was about eight years old. This is where, like, see, I had a mad accent, do you know what I mean? So growing up, I had a bit of a Cumbria accent, a bit of whatever accent, and then moving to Newcastle. So I'm sort of, like, not bullied as such, but, like, people just took the piss out of my accent all the time, like, where's he from? You've got like a mad, mad accent, blah, blah, blah. And then... Um, so you get bullied for your accent? German, Geordie, what about all over the gap? So we weren't, it weren't German. So we lived on an army base, a, a, an English army base. Mm -hmm. 
in a place called Osnabrück. Um, and I don't remember much, much. I had a couple of army mates. Like, when when you live in like English army camps in, in different country and Germany, everyone's sort of like one family. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's lived in this big block, block of flats. Everyone was, everyone was army. Everyone's kids was army. Do you know what I mean? You always, everyone sort of knew each other. Um, but I don't. I haven't really got much of a memory of of Germany. Little 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 memories of like the naffy going to the naffy parties and and barbecues stuff like that all army all all, all army and then um, which is mad because when i joined the army somebody one of my rsms will get to that <laughs> he was like so you're such and such a son he was like i remember you and, the, and this was my rsm do you know what i mean which is like the regimental sergeant major like the the, the big bollocks you know what i mean the person everyone's scared of so he was like, he was like, I remember you when you were like four or five years old because obviously my stepdad, he, he went on to do 25, 26 years in the army. So he was a sergeant major. So he, they all know each other, the sergeant majors, because they've all went through everything together, especially in certain regiments. So I joined the artillery. So they all, they all knew, all RSMs know each other from either starting together or doing sergeant majors courses together or going through the ranks or whatever. So they all knew each other. So everyone, like I say, it was just, it's a big, big place, but everyone, small, mm -hmm. small community sort of thing. But um, we moved to Newcastle when I was, I was eight. Um, went to normal school. Everything was, was sound, to be fair. Um, went to school, high school, middle school. Um, and I was knocked about with the hard kids. Big, big, big rave at me. Big, big into me, like, me monkey. You ever heard of the new monkey? The no. Makina. It's big up here now. Is that? Yeah, the rave, the, the rave up here. It's like Makina music, like, mm -hmm. and seeing shit like that. <laughs> yeah. It, is, it did transition for, well, funny enough, it's Spanish, the music, Spanish Makina, but it somehow ended up big in Newcastle and then big in, big in Scotland. But I was big, big into that. And I used to go to the quayside every, every, every week, get the new tapes set, sets every, every week. So the popular kids, the hardest kid in the school, he used to want my over earphone on me, on me Walkman. So I was always with him. Do you know what I mean? So because I was always with like the hard kids, it was sort of like, it was all right in school. But then my mom moved, right? Once she'd split up with me stepdad and everything, she moved to this other estate in Blake though, which was like total other end of where I was from, all my school. And it was rough, it was rough, rough as fuck. So instantly, I was disliked. I was about 13, 14 at this point. I was disliked straight away because I'm from a different area, from a different school. I sound a bit different anyway. Like I ain't got a broad Geordie accent. It's a bit like diluted a bit. So um, I, everyone took a total dislike to us straight away. So I used to have to get the bus from Blake to Leamington, where I was originally from, knocking about with all my, ki all my, all my mates and that, all the kids. And then get the bus back but then when i was getting the bus back the way i had to go home i had to pass everybody all the time so i either had to walk like all the way around or like jump through gardens to avoid people stuff like that and it was pretty heavy to be fair like every day every every fucking day i was just having to avoid people i got stabbed in the leg what for for being me <laughs> mate to be honest when that happened as well right so pretty pretty bad one as well right in my right in my leg there so it just like just pierced the artery a little bit so mm. it, it made it pretty like heavy blood do you know what i mean but when it happened it must have been adrenaline so i was walking down this cut this alleyway and i had to i had to get down it to get to where i wanted to be otherwise i had to walk an extra 20 minutes so I get up there and I walk through in the wall at the end. It's on a Friday night, there's about 15 of them. I was sat there and I thought, I've already started walking. So you know when you start walking in the spot, you thought, I can't turn around now. I'm already like, I've com I'm committed. So I thought, fuck it, I'll walk up. So I got up to the wall and I thought, all right, we're past. And then as I just turned, turned me back, I just felt like this fucking thud pushed into a fence, getting cracked a few bits. But then I felt like a dead leg. Do you know what I mean? Like someone's just give you a proper dead leg. And it ended up getting away, and I sprinted down the street, sprinted home, literally sprinted home. Fuck knows how I'd done it. Got home, and then I was like, just pull me past that. And I was like, and my mum comes in the kitchen, and it's just the 
But mate, it looked like a fucking, it looked like a fanny on my leg. It was just <laughs> wide open, just blood squirting out. My mouth starts screaming. She's like, what happened? What happened? I was like, I, I, I fell off a wall. <laughs> still, which is mad. Till, still to this day, she thinks that happened because she mentioned it to me, me bird. The other week. Remember that time you fell off a wall and gashed all your leg open? And me, me bird just looked at us and was like, fell off a wall. She was like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that happened for about four or five years. Like literally like fucking avoiding, avoiding anyone I could see because nobody in that estate liked us for no reason. Just like if one person doesn't like you, they, you know what kids are like, they just start chatting. And yeah. so I was always trying to hide from people. And then I um, started skateboarding right after I left school, but because skateboarding was more of a like, it was like a goth thing. Yeah, it wasn't it's really not, cool. It's not, that. but it was classed as like something like that. And that was just, you know what? I enjoyed it. I just... Started randomly doing it with this, this, me, me little brother started skateboarding one day and he was like doing an ollie and that. And I was like, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. So he showed us and then I started doing that. I thought, I couldn't, it's all right there. So I was going to like the local skate park and that. But because I was like a chav, right, I couldn't walk down the street with a skateboard or anything like that. But then when I got to the skate park, I couldn't dress like a chav because they were all dressed in like vans and all like skater gear. Yeah. So I'd like leave my house in chavy gear, have me all my stuff in me, in me bag and when i got there i'd switch into different shoes different mm -hmm. it's mad it's mad like constantly thinking what other people think about you which playing is... parts all the time to fit into other people yeah which it's is... mad the skaters and that though that like, you see them and 20 years ago it was like we used to fight them and stuff like, after school and it was mad because you look at them now they're, they're cool bastards man just floating about in their skateboard and their skates and just you might see them at the skate park and you're thinking man that's unbelievable what they do it's yeah. that strong yeah. and and yet because if you never played football were done boxing you're, cool. you're, you're not cool mm. it's fucking weird, we, weird things have changed weird, now though it? thankfully and a lot of people a lot more people are accepted i know i know it is a lot better now like it, back then you were just you were just victimized for for you just oh, you were off you were you were, you were yeah uh, people who i did know from school would be like on msn be like uh oh yeah you were goth now you were like a skater and i'm like no no i'm not goth i'm mm -hmm. not goth I was just skating, you know, and I fucking enjoyed it. I was good at it as well. Yeah. It was all right. It was really good. And then, where we are now, about 15. And then, then I always knew I was going to join the army. army. I was dog shit in school, mate. Dog shit. Weed, smoking, fucking. I mean, even they had fucking pill and that here and there. I was only, I was young, young, mm -hmm. man. Really young. Um, like I said, I was a rave. I was, I was ugh, my breeding ground was the, the monkey, this club in Sunderland, the new monkey. Um, I was there constantly and it was like, a club that was open from 10, 10 at night till 7 in the morning didn't sell alcohol at all no no alcohol license it was a private member's club fuck knows how they got away with it they did get closed down in the end like, it lasted about 10 years though um, and it was just it, the, the people who owned it were grafting the pills like stuff like that so I was constantly like on it then telling me my house staying at mates' house whatever just thinking fuck to be fair <laughs> do you know what I mean um, and then we, I was going to join the army, that was it. So I was about 16, you was joining the army, didn't give a fuck about school, GCSE, didn't care. I'm joining the army. I Did don't you think, just want away? I think so, yeah. I just wanted away from Newcastle, wanted away from, I just always knew I was going to join the army. Like, I was just grew up with that, like being a pad brat. I just, everyone, I don't know, it was just constant army. I always knew I was going to join the army. And I always thought, do not matter how, how thick or smart you are, because the army will have you. Like, there's always people without the best educations, like go and join the infantry or, or the artillery or something like that. So I um, I joined the army. Little did I know that when I joined the army, they put me through all these courses to get the equivalent A to C in, I can't remember what it was called now, like they changed, changed the the exams now, what it was like. Anyway, it was the equivalent to, to an A to C. So I got there and I was like, they were like, you didn't do very well in school, so you need to do these courses. I was like, fuck's sake. I was like, I was telling the teachers, I don't need this shit. I don't, I'm joining the army. But uh, when I did go to join the army at 16, I fucked my collarbone there, skateboarding. Bad skateboarding incident. And it held me off for like another year. So I went to college, done art. Don't know why I done art. Um, just, I think I needed to do something because my mom wouldn't get benefits and shit anymore if I weren't in education so I had to do something or I was getting thrown out because I did have a job in B&Q but I fucked that up by robbing from the till as you do huh? <laughs> <laughs> by your pose and your read of the weekend well I, I outsmarted them somehow got caught in the end but 
if it didn't, like, so what I'd done was, right, you used to be able to void on the receipts. Mm -hmm. So if you come in and you bought something and I was like, oh shit, I've made a mistake, you just press void and then it would void the receipt. So whenever someone come in and they were, especially if they were buying like builders shit, like construction shit, they always had the exact amount of cash because they always knew what they were getting. This it was bags of plaster or or whatever. They'd always go do, 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 and they'd have because they probably buy that amount ev every time. Mm -hmm. So they had the exact amount of cash. So what I'd do is I'd always thought these guys ain't returning this plaster, are they? If you've got if you've got leftover bags of plaster, you're probably going to use it on another job. So I'd just go do, 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 void. And then the cash they'd give us, remember them little pennies being queued out, mm -hmm. the orange ones straight in, straight in the pocket there. I'm making like 400, 400 quid a day and that, just bop, 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 void, void. And then I got too greedy, way too greedy, and I'd done it with a fireplace that was 499 quid. And he had the cash, I remember as I scanned it, 500 quid, he had the cash in his hand and I was like, fucking void, boom. I thought, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have done that. Well, he tried to return the fire. And when he tried to return the fireplace, that's when it had void. So it wasn't working. Fucking shit back then, man. Telling you proper little shit. But my ma worked at being cute at the time, so it was embarrassment on her. Do you know what I mean? She mm -hmm. weren't she weren't happy at all. Um so I got sacked from being Q, obviously, got arrested and everything. Um so I went to college for a little bit while I was waiting for um the army to let me because for some reason if you break a bone, you've got to wait a full twelve months. You've, you, until I don't know why. I think because if you get, if you're in the army and you get medically discharged, they've got to continue paying you for 12 months. Mm -hmm. If you get discharged from the army for medically reason, they have to pay you still your wages. So the deferred had had to wait about for a year. So when I was 17, I ended up joining the army. Um, and like I say, I got bullied a lot. Like not in school, but in this new estate. I was like, fucking it. Everybody hated us, like I said, for no reason. <laughs> I had a couple mates, a couple mates, but like most of the big boys, the hard cunts from, because there was another school just around the corner and they all went to that school. So all the hard boys from that school who know there's a guy from Warbottle, different school, miles away, is now living here, knocking about here. It's like ego thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like just, you know what? Can't see out because that's what kids yeah. are like, aren't they? It's just. What was it like joining the army? Well, was it exciting or was it just more fear that? They potentially could get bullied in there like you did in the streets. Well, I was just buzzing to get away, get away from it all, start start over again, start a new life. And then when, cause I was fake, <laughs> like, uh, like the the instructors would be telling you something, and like, obviously they, they take the pace, especially in basic training. So we went to Perbite for basic training. I joined the artillery, so it was down south, and like obviously their job is to try and break you because you've got like eight weeks, you're there for 12 weeks, but you've got eight weeks before they'll let you leave. And like, all right, goodbye. Your contract hasn't officially started yet. They give you like a little time frame just in case you don't like it. So their job is to literally try and break you within them times, because if you can handle it, you'll go through and you'll be all right. Because once you get into your regiment, like it's a different ball game, do you know what I mean? The banter, the, if you can't take it, like, you're you fat. can't join the army, man, mm -hmm. you can't. You've got to be able to take the one and give it, just laugh, yeah. do you know what I mean? So. I was getting like the piss taken out of us all the time for being fake and like can't move on parade. This was my problem. I'm I'm a bit. I don't know whether it's ADHD or like or what. Like I'm a bit fucking like Stuff. this. Yeah, like moving all the time and like mm -hmm. you know. So when you're on parade, you've got to be fucking still. Boom, stand for attention. And I've just been like looking, <laughs> looking around. Like so, the instructor be like McGraffin. Like what the fuck are you doing? I'm like well, like just I wasn't even fucking thinking. But then over other people start trying to take the piss. So I remember lying in, in my bed one night thinking, like, am I gonna go through this all over again? Like, if I start letting these bully me now, this is gonna continue throughout my whole army career. So I was like lying there in bed, I couldn't sleep, and I'm just thinking, what am I gonna, like the next day I'm gonna wake up and someone's gonna try and take the piss. So I was just like, I don't know, I just lost it. And this guy was like a Muay Thai fighter or something like that, and I fucking, a few people were scared of him, amazing shape he was a bit older as well um he was in amazing shape and like no one would say a word to him and he tried to take the piss and i was like fucking yeah so we ended up like right at each other and then i thought fuck this anyone who says anything i'm just gonna i ain't letting you take the piss out of us anymore i'm not I'm not going through this again like hiding from people not when to go out with people blah 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 so it was i could see it taking that little bit of route but then after that especially once you got to like phase two Phase two is a little bit more relaxed. You can start leaving 
camp and stuff like that. Well, that's when drink got involved. <laughs> so now we're going out. We're in a place called Salisbury and um, down south. And uh, we were out all the time, all the time in Salisbury. And I was getting mortal, mate, mortal. Jager bombs, like the lot. I was only a kid. Do you know what I mean? And I was getting fucked. And then obviously you're fighting with other regiments and stuff like that. And I just started thinking I was some boy. Just started thinking I'm some boy. And once you have the drink, it's like mad confidence, isn't it? You think you're fucking hard as fuck. Mm -hmm. So I ended up just scrapping with people all the time. And then I ended up, it was one of my mates actually, one of my good mates. So we went through basic together, ended up going through phase two together. He was out. I don't know what the fuck was on up with him. He was on a mad one. And then um, he got kicked out of this bar and it's only a small town. There's only a certain amount of clubs and bars in in the town. You can't just go like, all right, we'll go somewhere else because there ain't many places to go to. And if you've been kicked out of one, more than likely you ain't getting in that other one because they're like radio to each other, don't they? Mm -hmm. So this this guy's been a knob. And then one of my mates is like, I'm going out to see him. He's been kicked out. He goes out and he cracks me, mate. So I'm fuming at this point. I'm like, but who does he think he is? Well, I, was like, I go out. And then I'm like, what's your problem? And, they, and I'm good mates with him. And then he cracks me. I was like, oh, and the bouncers were watching it. But I looked to the side and all I seen was these red berries. And that's the police. That's the army police, the military police. I seen them walking up the street. So I was like, right, I ain't got to do shit. The, the bouncers were like, we've seen it was him. But go back in, enjoy your night. Blah, blah, blah. So I've went in, left it. He's went back to barracks. And the more I've drank, the more I'm getting more pissed off. I'm like, who the fuck does he think he is? The cheeky little cunt, I'm getting more and more pissed off. So I get back to the camp and I go straight to his block. <laughs> I get up the stairs. It's an old school army blocks, these. We're like sharing rooms, eight man rooms sort of thing. And like them, them metal beds with green police mattresses sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Old school. And then uh, I see him come, <laughs> coming out of the communal shower. And he had a towel around him, dripping wet. I just ran up to him and just started fucking battering him. And you know what? He was an odd cunt, you know. He's an Irish lad. And um, he was an odd bastard. Him. And he's like, he's soaking wet, so I'm slipping all over him. Do you know what I mean? It was mad. My mates, I'm glad they weren't like, there was camera phones and that at the time, but like they weren't the greatest because we're talking 2005, six or something. 17 yeah, years yeah. ago. So, um, <laughs> it had been like, you know what I mean? We're rolling on top of each other. He's naked. Do you know what I mean? They're literally bollock naked. So he's on top of it, he's fucking bashing us. Somehow I ended up pulling him off as anyway, this this um this instructor come and he was two nine commando, which is like the the um the marines of the of the artillery. So each regiment has like you've obviously got the marines, you've got the powers, but in some of the other regiments you can have like they call them snidey ones, like you're a snide power. So if you were in the in the um artillery and you were a power it was seven rha seven power rha and like the real powers would like look down on these because then you're not in the infantry you were, you were attached but you were still had to go through like the again the school school boy games again in there even within the army so um he was one of them he was quite fit as fuck and he's come and he said what are you doing he's brought us up and he was like i thought we're gonna get fucked yeah and he, he goes like you back to your block you back to he's obviously seen it a million times he was a sergeant i mean he's seen it all back at camp he's, and we're we're still only trainees just phase two trainees so he's like go back go back and anyway he must have been pissed off now so he's come back he's come back to my room and they had these like these um did 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 to you know to get through mm -hmm. but because he was one of my best mates and we were all mates he knew the code i knew the code to his room he knew the code to my room there was a big front door right must have been about one two o'clock in the morning um the big front door i've missed a bit actually i've missed a bit i've went to the end there we were back and forth anyway he come over had a scrap with me i went back over to him had a scrap we were scrapping in the car park at one point and then about going on for hours this back and forth i'd batter him he'd come over batter me i'd gone batter him this same sergeant seeing us in the car park he said what are you two doing he's like you back to your i'm in boxer shorts mate i've been chased with a fire extinguisher by him like fucking mental Right, and this is one of my best mates. We're just pissed up, badly, badly pissed up. And um, so he goes back to your fucking room. You back to your room. You back to your room. Anyway, it's all died down at this point. And then the the main door on the building was like a, a windy door. And it shuts itself, and I heard poof. Smell was gone. Open my eyes, and then I heard his Irish accent walking down the corridor. I thought, Fuck! So my room was like my bed was the first one by the door. 
the very first one. So I've got up and all I've heard is did 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 and that's fine. I can hear a few of them. So I've, I've grabbed my iron. Obviously, you have to iron your clothes in the army. It's a must. Every day you have to have your creases down, yeah. Your creases down your front like they they if you're you go on parade and you've not got gleam and kit, you're gonna get picked up on it and like a guide, they call it, which is like when they punish you somehow, they'll give you like jobs to do or something like that. So um I've grabbed my iron and I've just fucking levered him with it but as the lights come on there's three of them and they've got do you know like your, your wardrobe but you hang your clothes up and you know the bit in the middle what comes out mm -hmm. the metal bit they all had them in their hands they all had them so I thought they've come to lever me yeah, while I'm asleep anyway I've bashed them up with this with this iron and then the light comes on there's you know what I'll never forget it he was up against the fucking the cupboard like this just fucking shaking like spasming sort of thing and I was like what have I done and everyone in the block was like do you know like sort of didn't let me move stood there they were on the phone like someone's coming like I knew I was getting nicked at this point I knew it and I spent a night in the in the cell of that um barracks just like an old school cell spent the night in there and then um obviously the next day he said his part as of my part but it was a heavy offense that do you know what I mean but he, I remember seeing him out the window the next day. He had like, um, like a, a, a mummy, just, <laughs> just stuff all over his head. Like I'd let this, this, this iron was in pieces. Luckily, was that didn't matter on it. Pretty much, yeah. And luckily, one of my best mates at the time, he fucking hid that iron. He hid that iron. So I'm like, when they asked my story, I was like, look. Oh, I took. They had these poles in their hand, and I said, I took the pole off him, and I battered him with the pole. Um, so when they went to his room, they noticed all of the poles were missing out. The cupboard stuff was kind of going in my favour. The thing is with the army, especially in phase two, you um, so everyone's getting distributed to your chosen regiment. You choose in phase, well, in phase one, you choose where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Each each artillery regiment has their own different equipment, like the AS-90s, the light guns, that could even be the drones, like all the MLRS, which was the Newcastle Regiment my stepdad was in, which is like big fucking rockets, giant rockets. So you all choose where you want to go. I, I had chose the Newcastle Regiment. Um, and you can't go off to your regiment whilst under investigation because you don't get the army deal with the charges. So if it's a civilian offence, if I got nicked in the civvy street, the army take over, the, 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 the police can't charge you, the army then take over and they'll charge you, so they, they take over it. So they didn't want us two going back, going to our regiments we had chosen because they don't want to deal with it when it comes, because we were under court martial, which is pretty bad in the army. If you get court martialed, it's like, it's like going to Crown Court of, of in Civvy Street. So we're getting, uh, we're both getting court martialed, which is taking a while. We both have to have like solicitors and we're, we're, we're pals again by this point. So this, this took a year. So you're only supposed to be in phase two training for 12 weeks. You get your driving done. You get like certain, like you learn to drive the Jeeps off road, stuff like that. You do certain, certain things in phase two, then you go to your regiment. So we were like, we were doing, we'd done all the courses. So we were sort of like stuck there, but with nothing to do. Do you know what I mean? Both of us, so we were sort of doing the same things over and over again, the same exercises, going away to like, when you go on exercise and like Salisbury playing or, or something like that, you do this. we're doing them over and over and over again because this court martial's taking its time. So during this time, I fucked up again. I so, <laughs> so everyone's going on this exercise and I thought, I ain't going on this exercise because I've done it twice. I thought I'm not. So I, I blagged illness, blagged some illness, went to the med center, blagged some illness, thought I'm staying on camp. So the sergeant major says to us, he said, you're confined at the camp. He says, you're not, just because everyone's got, the camp was, well, our part, the camp was divided by three regiments. So our regiment, 2-4 regiment, I think it was, was the phase two trainees. So he said, you aren't going out. We could go out on the weekend usually. You aren't going out. He said, you are confined at the camp. He's like, you're not going out. So I tried to walk off camp. Couldn't stop this. My car was flagged up as it was because of the registration. So I just couldn't get off the barracks at all. So um, I'm in the room and this other lad comes in. He was on the sick as well. And he goes, well, we weren't on the sick. We blagged it. But he, um, I see one of my mates in this room. I got on with him really well as well. He left his car keys out. 
So I just, I didn't know what car was his. Just literally hung out the window. Just, just did, did. I was like, there we go. I said, let's just go out in his car. No, not meaning anything, like, not meaning, like, to be a dickhead or anything, just to get off camp. We need to get off camp. So we drove into town, and the plan was to have a couple of drinks, come back. As bad as this sounds, obviously, we were just kids then. Um, and I fucking got more on them, rate his car off. I rate his car off in this, because um, it was like, where Stonehenge is, you ever been down there? Yeah. Right? That's where, we. the camp was right by Stonehenge. So when you come along, like, Stonehenge is on a motorway, isn't it? Like, if you're on the motorway, you can see it. On that motorway, there's a little turn off, and it's like a, um, it's like a country track. And it leads up to where, it's like a shortcut to where our, our camp was. And um, I went down there, mate, the weather was heavy, heavy. And we got tilted, ripped into this ditch. Couldn't get fucking out this ditch. Stuck, literally stuck, mortal. And only like, for some reason when you're pissed, you don't think about how bad the situation is. And then you It's kinda, always a good idea. Yeah. And then you open your eyes, hung over and you go, <clears throat> and it all hits you what you've done, doesn't it? You go, oh, fuck. So I was like, shit. I was like, we need to get this, um, we need to go and get this car. But what happened when we were there, Funny enough, as we're walking along the main road, the police pull, covered in mud, the both of us. And it's like, what? What's happened? And then it comes down, the car's there and everything. G they give us a lift back to the fucking... The, Army barracks. Yeah. And I'm going to them, mate, you need to do us a favour, mate. I'm like, we can't get dropped off by the police. Well, mainly, I couldn't walk into barracks because I'm supposed to be confined at the camp. So I can't walk through the main entrance. So I went, mate, you can't drop us off at the main entrance. I went, if they see police dropping us off, there's going to be alarm bells ringing, blah, blah, blah. Don't know why I didn't get breathalyzed, like, but they said in their statement, like, the main one didn't seem intoxicated, only the other the other one seemed intoxicated because I had blagged. I was just picking my mate up from, from the, out on the piss and just, and this has happened because of the bad weather so he didn't breathalyze us and i mean you're gonna have to drop us off on the corner so we had to like climb over the fucking army like barbed wire fences and stuff like that through this random field to get back into camp and then the next day i remember thinking i'm gonna take the land rover because i know i used to be on guard a lot because i was always in trouble they used to put you on guard which is a bit of like a bit of a punishment um so i was like i'm gonna take the, the land rover guard um, truck and I'm going to go and pull that car out of the fucking ditch so anyway, I've woken up in the morning and they'd all come back the coach pulled up in the car park and they're all getting off so anyway he spotted his car <laughs> <laughs> he's come in and I'm like mate I've got something to tell you and he was like oh no he didn't I told him first I've got something to tell you he's like what and I didn't think he'd grass I just thought like look I'm going to pay you for your car I'm going to buy you a new car whatever he went straight over he's grassed on his I'm not surprised, to be fair. So then I've put back into that fucking cell thing. Um, so I was there even longer. I had two court marshals, one for stealing the car off camp and the other one for hitting the guy with the iron. What's the sales like in the army? These ones. Well, these ones were on camp, so they were like a cell. They were a cell usually in the guard office. Um, it, like when you get to Colchester, it's a bit different and in, in like the glass house, they call it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's called MCTC now. They don't call it Collie anymore. Military Training Correction Centre. Yeah. So you've got uh, two court marshals that... Yeah, two court marshals. So I'm, my my regiment don't want me. So at this <clears> point, my stepdad, he was a sergeant major at the Newcastle Regiment and he's hearing all about what I'm doing because everyone knows who he is. Everyone knew my stepdad was a sergeant major. So I got a little bit like... Are you with? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. I should have been kicked out fucking well before that, to be honest, but I, I, I didn't. I got in, and my sergeant major of that camp, he was really good mates with um, my stepdad, so I, I got away. It was just I always like, I remember him saying to us one day, he's like, you're not a dickhead. He's like, you're not a dickhead. It's just, it's all alcohol related. He was like, you're a good soldier. He's like, you just, alcohol. He's like, mm -hmm. doing something, trying to like, I was just young, I couldn't handle it, mate. Mm -hmm. A couple of pints, I'd just be fucking thinking I was... Why do you think you do that? Like, your mum got you the job being cute, you kind of fucked her over, your stepdad's kind of fine at every corner, probably wants you to stay in there because he knows if you're outside, you're probably going yeah. to be a lost soul. He's wanting maybe some discipline in there, but again, you keep fucking that over. That. Like, why do you think that is? I have no idea, mate. I wish I could answer that. Yeah. I have no idea. Just a dickhead, honestly. Back then, like, I've grew up a bit now. It took me a long time to grow up. Probably about 28 by the time I grew up, like, but um, I don't know why I fucked it up, but I did feel like, 
the embarrassment of it, but I was just like, look, he, do you know what the thing is though? It took him nine years to get his Lance Jack, which is like the first stripe, because uh, he was constantly fucking up when he was in Germany. It took him long. Everyone was saying he was never going to get promoted. He was always fucked up. He was always going to jail, like just for silly things. So he couldn't really say a lot. But once he got his Lance Jack after nine years, he flew. He lit, like once he'd switched on, he flew through the ranks. Like, do you think just, he's seen a bit of you and him? Maybe, maybe. Well, I've grew, he was the one who, who I grew up with. So like, like my dad was around when I was a kid, but then we moved to Germany. So like, I didn't see him. He couldn't keep in touch with shit then. I don't think him and my mum, there was no mobile phones back then. Mm -hmm. It might have been, but it would have been them fucking yeah. old school things, um, which nobody had. So you couldn't really keep, couldn't really keep in touch. And he moved house a lot, but in this one area, Maryport. So I remember like, I didn't really have sort of lost touch. I'll tell you what, there's a story with me, me, me and my brother, right? So growing up in Maryport, I obviously recognised my brother. Now, it's been years since I've been to Maryport because we've lived in Germany. So and my nana lived there. So I spent, and everybody lived on this same street. So anyway, I'm about eight, nine years old and I see that I'm with one of my mates and I see this guy. And we're looking at each other, like giving each other evils. And I'm like, I fucking know that guy. And he's like, what are you looking at you? And I'm like... Like, we're going to have a scrap. And I says to this kid, Sean, I went, who's that? He went, his name's Chris. And I went, Chris McGraffin? He went, yeah. So I went up to him and he's like, what? And I went, you're my brother. Because <laughs> we hadn't seen each other in like, a vase. It's like subconsciously I knew it was me, brother. Because like, you change a lot as a kid, don't you? Like mm -hmm. in the short space of years, you, you change, proper change. But yeah, so I didn't really have my dad around a lot until I got a bit older and I could start making the decisions for myself to like get in touch with him, go and see him. He had moved to Blackpool. So it weren't until then. So really back then, John, my stepdad, he was who I had been kind of brought up with until I was mm. about 12 maybe. Did you hold any resentment against John once it moved you away from Germany because you no, couldn't see your dad? No, 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 not at all. Didn't John's he a think, good guy? Didn't, yeah, John's a good guy, yeah. So was my dad like... John was a good guy, do you know what I mean? I, I've, I've learned, like, my muse, my taste in music. It's all because he was constantly playing CDs. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. little things like that. Like, I just remember John was, he was a good guy, John. He was always buying me stuff. He was always, always, uh, no problems with John whatsoever. Did you want to be in the army or were you doing all that shit to nah, kind of get kicked out? I wanted out? to be in the army. I wanted to be in the army. I did. I wanted to be in the army. I don't know what... <clears throat> I don't know why. I do regret it. I tried to join the army back um, <laughs> just two years ago because they changed the they changed the age to um, they changed the age from thirty two to to like thirty nine. So I was like, I can join the army again, but the the neck tattoo it's too much. They said. So I thought I'm gonna do it right this time. I'm gonna mm -hmm. fucking do it right. I didn't. I weren't for the money or nothing like that because I've I've made my money elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, like only fans, all that sort of stuff. It was because like I felt like I failed. I failed in the army. So I had to like get that back from me, mm -hmm. sort of thing. So you've got two charges hanging over your head. What mm -hmm. happens there? So how old were you? Eighteen, nineteen. Still a kid, man. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. hard to say. Fucking screw the head no, and make changes. If somebody I told know. me eighteen, I'd do this and do that, I'd have told them to fuck off. Well, John decided you're not coming to my regiment. He's like, you're a bit of a liability. You're not coming to Three Nine Regiment in Newcastle because one, it was home. So all my friends around, and he had, he used to have people who were from Newcastle and they didn't live on barracks because they were from Newcastle and they chose the home regiment. They'd be ringing up sick or the mum would be, oh, he's not coming into work today because he's, it. he was like, you're not coming to Newcastle. He's like, I'm sorting you out. And anyways, this regiment in Germany, 2-6 regiment was a big, everybody wanted to go to Germany. It was only two regiments within the artillery that were based in Germany. So they were always, 2-6 was the main one because of its location and got a slow. Um, everybody wanted to go. That was everyone's first choice. So only the best got into that sort of thing. If you were a dick, you didn't get into that. Well, he sorted it out and I got that transfer because he was like, you're not coming to my regiment. He went, name a regiment and I'll sort it out. I was like, two six. And he was like, right, cool. Thinking, you're not going to be able to sort two six for me. <laughs> mm. So he, um, next minute I get called into the captain's office and it was this transfer over. You're going to two six, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I don't know how this has happened, but the powers above have granted it 
and you don't a two six. So that was just basically get out of the country, go and sort your fucking life out. Germany's the wrong place to send me <laughs> as a piss head kid. Mm -hmm. Definitely the wrong place. But these two charges, I had to wait for them to be done. So I'd done these two. Two. What they ended up doing was rather than keeping us in two forward, to say I said there was three regiments distributed on the one camp. Mm -hmm. To rather than keeping me going through t training over and over, I was like, this is winding me up. It's been like a year and a half. Like everyone I'm seeing, recruits come and go, come and go constantly while I'm still there, just seeing fresh faces come 12 weeks later, go. So I'm just seeing these fresh faces over and over. So they put me onto one of the other barracks on um, on camp, which was, um, oh, was it 3-4 battery or something like that? I can't remember, but it was basically, you're out on the range every day, every single day you're out on the range. And it was either classed to other people in other regiments. This was either classed as the Naughty Boy Regiment, because it was a posting. People got posted there for two years. So even if you were, either you were a mong at your job, and just not very good, they send you there because you're on the range every single day you end up coming back switched on because you spend two years learning your job every day rather than like when you when you're back at actual regiments a bit more relaxed sometimes you're not doing a lot all day just turn up to parade you might have pt in the morning you might you might just be sweeping around or just you know what i mean doing not not a lot sometimes so they'll send you to this regiment either if you were a dickhead and always getting in trouble or if you were a bit of a not very good at your job so I ended up getting sent there, which I loved. I loved it because I weren't a recruit anymore. I was back normal. They were treating me like a like an adult, like a sports or something. I was like, come on. I was like, please, I can't. I'm getting in more and more trouble because I'm stuck here. I was like, it's like a vicious circle. I'm stuck here and I'm bored. I don't know what to do. So he, he, he sort of took a little chance in us. Now everyone knew I was the dickhead from the other battery. Everyone had heard about us. Everyone knew. <laughs> Doing, but I proved myself then. I'd done really well. I got on with the Sergeant Major. I got on with everyone and I proved I'm not a dickhead. I was just... I was young just, and Yeah, yeah. I was still young. Don't get as long. I was still young. I was just with older people and I was just getting trekked a bit better by this guy. Like this guy, Shane, he was a sergeant and he was a Newcastle supporter. So like we had a bit in common there. Do you know what I mean? So he, he was always like, oh, Jordy, Jordy. Like, so we, we, we got on and then anyway, I went to my regiment. The court marshals stopped and when I got there... That my new sergeant major was like, when your name popped up on a piece of paper, like they all go right. Let's say there's like 50 names. James English, you'll go on that regiment. Dan McGrathen, you'll go on that regiment, blah, blah, blah. So the, the, the BSM, Battery Sergeant Major, he got my name and he's like, nobody wanted me. Every, every sergeant major didn't want me. Now, the RSM, the regimental sergeant major who was mates with me, stepdad, his name was Kane. So I used to go by the name of Dan Kane when I was in school, up until obviously it weren't changed by Depol and nothing. So my passport and my birth certificate and everything still said McGrathen. But as soon as we moved to Newcastle, I just, I don't know, I think it was just through arm, the schools in the army. Like I just started going as Dan Kane. So as I joined the army, I was, I was Dan McGrathen. So this RSM didn't have a fucking clue who I was because he's not recognising the name of Graffin. So anyway, we I get told by my sergeant major, nobody wants you. And when I got told you're having me, they basically done a fucking short straw of who was getting me. And he was like, I do not want you. He was like, you're a fucking dickhead. He's like, I know everything you've done in training. He's like, I don't want you in my regiment, but I've got to have you. So at this point, I knew I'm getting trekked like a dickhead, yeah. I'm like, they don't like me. The worst jobs, the worst jobs were like when we went away. We'd go away on exercises and stuff. And I was in the, the JCB, big telescopic JCB, which doesn't sound like a bad job. If you think about it, you're just driving about in the JCB. I thought this is pretty fucking cool, this. And I got my, because um, it was classed as a, a a bigger vehicle, you had to have your C license to do it. So I got put through my, my lorry license and everything to do it. So that was a big bonus. And um, anyway, we were away in um, Czech Republic, I think we are, six weeks. And um, I'm driving this JCB thinking, yeah, it's a cool job, this, right? But I get no downtime because I'm the one who has to take down the rounds to the big tanks, the AS-90s, the big fuckers, big, big rounds, like crates of them. And it's like, but literally, when these eight, there could be eight of them in a row and they'll get like a fire mission. And like, when they go the whole fucking cab rocks. Like I could be 100, 200 foot away and the JCB up, boom. 
So as I drop off my my bits, or their bits, sorry, it's now my turn to get some admin, get my head down. But how the fuck can you get your head down when there's nine ES90s going off one after another? You just can't, so I was losing me shit, big style. And he was just like, like, because I was the dickhead. Do you know what I mean? I was the dickhead. So, and this had happened, I mean, I've skipped a good couple of years here. Um, this was what made me lose the plot. I proper lost the plot. <laughs> and I just refused to soldier. I just like, was like, no, I'm not doing it. And I remember someone saying, when you refuse to soldier, you have to, because you can't take an order. So refusing to soldier means you can't, you don't listen to what anyone says. So like the Sergeant Major was like, I was like, I'm refusing to soldier. Like it's pretty unheard of for someone to step up and say this to a Sergeant Major. Like, no, fuck you, I'm refusing to soldier. So I was fucking shit scared. They never just kick fuck out you, can they? Yeah, I took a few beatings off Sergeant Majors a few times, like, especially in training. They could have done, yeah, but there's too many people about. Too many people about. So, like, I remember him going, fucking stand there now. So I was like, right. He was like, I'm going to get a captain or something like that. Stand there now. So I stood there. And then I was like, no, I won't fucking stand here now because I'm taking an order, aren't I? I'm soldiering. I've took an order. So I just started walking around in circles. I lost my head big style, but I know what it was. It was sleep. I weren't getting any sleep because when they expected me to sleep, that was when them rounds were going off. And then when them were all finished their fire mission and there's all this shrapnel, I mean, they're leaving giant, like the, the cases are like this and it's got all the ammunition inside of it, the big, big things. And it's up to me to then put all that in the crates, pick them all up, get them all back while everyone else is getting their head down. This is after the fire mission. So then I'm working through the night here. So I would just weren't, and then it's back up again, do this. I weren't getting any sleep and I, I lost my head big style. And then they put me in front of this, the commanding officer, big, big thing that. <laughs> and my sergeant major was a, um, he was an ex uh, Marine, two nine commando one. So he was fit as fuck. He was a, he was a, he was a he, it was a beast. He used to make us do PT every single morning because when we done SEALs PT, which was once a month, SEALs PT was like the regimental PT and it was always hard, super hard. Our battery had to win every time. So he beasted us every single morning. And we did win, to be honest. We were all mega fit, but this guy was dead scary. Anyway, we get put in front of this SEAL and I lost my head and I just come up with a mental story. I'm not going to repeat it because it wasn't true. And I, I don't believe in that shit anymore. I say shit, shit can happen. So I made up this story anyway. Lost my head, somehow started crying. <laughs> don't know how, I just fucking lost it. So they give me some compassionate leave. And they said, just go on, go on, get, sort yourself out, come back when you're, when you're sorted. So anyway, while I was back on that leave, I'd went to some rave, got super fucking pissed, drove me car, <laughs> flipped it on the central hit the central reservation um, and fucking flipped it. Didn't even have my seatbelt on either. Big turning point in my life that. Didn't have my seatbelt on or anything. All I had was this little little scratch on my head there. And I thought, I got out of the car, it was about seven o'clock in the morning on the M1. And I was like, some woman stopped, she was like, are you all right? And I thought, because the car, I got, when you're in Germany, you can get uh, tax-free cars and they give you to the, the army people all the time because they know you can afford it. So the finance you, so I had like a, we had a VXR, which at the time you couldn't get insured because it was a two litre and I was like 19. <laughs> so I was, it was all right to drive around Germany because it had an English reg, reg plate and you had to do something called B, BFG, British Forces Germany. So you had to like turn your car from English registered, same registration plate, but it would be BFG sort of thing. So that means like if you went through speeding cameras or anything in Germany, it, it, they could link to who you were. But I didn't do that. I got someone who I knew to, to pass me off. You had to have a little permit. If you didn't have a permit, you couldn't get in camp. So I got one of my mates to pass me off on the sly. So I wasn't insured on this car. So anyway, I smashed that car up. I hit the central reservation. I remember getting a letter through the door. Like I caused 30 grand worth of damage on the M1. Like, this was when I was in jail, this in Collie. Um, <clears throat> and then I thought, I'm not going back. So I went AWOL. I went AWOL and I had, I'd met a bird who was from Northampton. So I was living with her. I was getting phone calls off me ma, me stepdad, like, what's, where are you? Please, like, they're looking for you. They were parked up outside my house at one point, like, and I'm like giggling to myself, like, ha, they're looking in Newcastle, like, not a clue. 
that I've met a bird in Northampton and that's where I was. So I was hiding out there for like a year, a good year. And then <laughs> I ended up getting a job and you can't get a job if you're here well, but it was agency work. So I got away with it somehow and I got this job. And I, I thought, oh, the army are full of shit if you get a job. Like, because they stopped paying us after about, they paid us six months though. Six months of being here, well, full pay. So um, once that had done, I got this job. And uh, they, nothing happened, like I said. So when I didn't have the agency work, I had my HGV. So I tried to get a job at um, UPS. And I put the army as a reference, thinking they're not going to check. But they did. And they were like, he's still an active short soldier can we have the addresses give you? So obviously they linked that to them and next minute I had like nine officers knocking on my door at two o'clock in the morning going, um, you're here well from the army? I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not, I'm hanging out the window. I'm like, I'm not even in the army, you mad at what are you talking about? So anyway, they come in and then they just see me army burgling on the floor, like loads of army stuff just kicking about, do you know what I mean? So anyway, they nicked it, kept me in, just kept me in somewhere for about nine days until someone from my regiment had come and picked me up to transport me to like a holding place. So that was another court martial I was getting at this point, which I got kicked out for. I did get offered to soldier on. They did say, look, because by the time I'd got back into the routine of ironing my clothes, getting back into being a soldier, I was like, all right, I'm back into the routine now. I was like, I wouldn't mind state soldiering on. They offered me to soldier on and I said no at first. And then when it come to me changing my mind and saying, can I still soldier on? They said, nah, it's past that now. You, you're getting discharged. So What's I, that feeling like for you? Getting discharged? I didn't really give a fuck. I didn't. How I, long did you do in the army? Six years. And you get free court marshals? Free court marshals, And what happens when yeah. they all get squashed? Yeah, you get your, you get your time. You either get collie or you get like fined. What's collie like? The army prisons it are. weren't too bad is that army prison yeah that's army it's in colchester yeah it weren't too bad there was a lot of a lot of like stories of of Collie when you're in there when you're in the army of how bad it is but it weren't that bad i think they tell you them stories so you don't go there what sort know? of stories oh just like you've, you you get fucking tra like shit you've got a clean you clean like not like the cliche stories you've got to clean the toilets with toothbrushes and you see in the films yeah not like that nah. not like that no to be honest it weren't too bad if you're soldiering on there's two wings a wing and b wing if you're soldiering on they send you to a wing and you have to do you have to do pt every day you have to stay fit you have to you have to do everything as in you are still in the army but if you go to b wing they know you're getting kicked out so they offer you like remission so if you got sentenced to a certain amount they can go you can be out in june your earliest possible can be june or your latest possible could be september so you have to earn that remission each day you can get five days of remission each week you've got to be good you've got to be because most people just go i'm getting kicked out anyway fuck you what what are you gonna do and they'll just ride it out but if you want that remission you want to get out early you've got to got to play a game so i played game anyway and there was there was this farm on camp and i proper liked the guy i don't know why because it was graft up there I had to clean the pig shit out nobody wanted to go so they used to have to dick people so they'd get you on a parade in the morning and collie and they'd just go like you 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 and i always used to volunteer for the farm because i liked the guy i just like i had a good crack with him so and he liked me because i'd turn up and graft i'd, I'd clean the pig shit i'd fucking do all of that it was quite cool to be fair on that farm like you'd feed like eagles with like um, chicks, you not know, like with the, the, glove, the glove on. on. Straight in, take its head off, neck its head off, and then take off with the bird. It was class. And he'd always let me do that. I don't know why I buzzed off that, but just like I just buzzed off the farm. So because I always, because I always volunteered for the farm and he always spoke highly of us, I always got my remission. But then my bird, the one from Northampton, she was visiting us. Now, it's not a proper prison, so they're not allowed to search you. They're only allowed to search us. We only have rights to search us as because the, as, they're not prison guards. They're in the army. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> she'd come in and she'd she'd be sneaking me all sorts in, like a big pouch of baccy, because baccy was worth money in there. And everyone had money because you're in the army. So back then, you'd just be like, you'd ring, ring, and I'd ring my bird. And I'd be like, has any money been transferred into the into the bank and she'd be like yeah yeah such and such and I'd be like okay and I'd, I'd be distributing the back of I made a fortune in that to be fair but then she started putting steroids in in the in the fucking in the pouch so every time she'd meet us she'd, she'd pass us it we had a, a nice little routine of how I would get it so she'd pass me it quick and I'd just hold it there 
and then I'd go to the toilet, but they took you to the toilet. You see, if you went, I'm going to the toilet, there'd be two of them. One would be stood there watching, like, everyone speaking or whatever, like, supervising, and then the other one would take you to the toilet. So what I would do was I'd, I'd wait till somebody, it would just be sat on my lap there, and I'd just wait till someone went to the toilet, and then as they went to the toilet, you'd walk through this door, and just as they would get to the door, I'd go, can I go to the toilet as well? And they'd go, go on, quick. So during this little point where I was unsupervised, I'd be like fucking really stashing it, stashing it good, because you get searched. So I'd be just putting it down there. I was selling these one jab of steroids, like test, whatever the fuck it was. I couldn't even tell you. I'm uneducated on that shit. But I knew it was worth money. So one jab, I was selling for a tenner, a tenner a jab. Yeah. So I'm active made some money in there. But anyway, one day I come back from the farm. And I'm searched, and fuck knows why. But you've got them pockets on your army gear. They're the big pockets. So he's patted me down, and he went, the fuck's that? So he's went in, and he's pulled these ta tablets out, and they've got, like, Arabic written on them and everything. He went, what the fuck are these? Oh, and I got them from the med centre, and he was like, the fucking Arabic, you daft cunt? Right, and I was like, and so anyway, he puts me in this room, don't move. Searched, um, ended up locking the whole prison down, every, the whole collie, everyone gets locked down. And then they've done a search, of the whole, the whole wing got searched, everyone's lockers. So obviously they found loads of shit in my locker, they found like lists, because I was double bubbling backy. Like, I didn't smoke, so I would go to, you got seven quid a week or something like that. And I would buy backy with my money for the, from the shop. And you'd double bubble it, you'd pass it to someone, you get double next week, don't you know I mean? And I'm like, 50 pouches of backy under the mattress, which I was selling on for like 10 to 20 quids or whatever like that when people had the money. Um, so yeah, so I got caught with that uh, and I ended up getting extra sentencing. So I fucked up in Collie as well. How long did you end up doing all together in there? Uh, about nine months in total. So once you get discharged, what's, what happens? What's the career path like then? Kind of rebelling against anybody who tells you what to do is the same you were getting told what to do does part of you feel as if you were getting bullied no not when it comes to like the the, high, stuff. the ranks because I was so young when I joined you just automatically looked up to them and respected them they were older than you they were higher ranks than you so if you're getting bollocked of someone you just took it yeah. whereas I found there was a few older people there was one guy I can't remember his name now but I remember he joined when he was like 29 so he was having to listen to younger people bollock him yeah. that must have been quite yeah. hard so what happens when you get discharged so when I get discharged I felt like I had my life back I moved to Northampton with this bird and I by because I joined so young like I said I was smoking weed and I was taking the odd pill and that when I was younger I was going to the monkey so I was fucking boom buzzing yeah I didn't do uh, no drugs in the army no weed no not I, did, I was quite good didn't I stuck to that that's the one thing I did stick to because you, you instantly discharge you get caught if you test positive in the army you're gone within a day you're out bags packed fucking see you there it's like the number one rule no drugs so yeah so you did have a better what yeah I did stick to that I did stick to something because if you want to do it, you're just going to smoke a joint or you're going to do yeah. something to get kicked out a lot of people used to sn and some of my mates some of my mates did smoke on leave because like, if you're going away on leave the only thing with the smoke it's in your system for a ages. long time the Charlie and that's two or three a days, days yeah. and you'd see people you'd see people come back off like off leave and you all you know I know you're getting tested you are if you've been on leave for three weeks you're getting tested especially in phase two you're getting tested when you get back if you go and leave for Christmas and you've got New Year and all that and you go back to work on like the 4th, 5th of January, you're getting fucking tested. Mm -hmm. So you'd see people like come back after Christmas leave, necking cranberry juice. Water, cranberry, cranberry juice, juice yeah. and orange juice in order to flush it out of you. Like you'd see them do it. And I was quite good. I didn't, I stuck to that one. So when I did get out there and I started going to the raves and that again, I was like, I felt free. I felt, I felt like I can fucking do what the fuck I want now. And I went on a, a fucking five year sesh <laughs> I just went on it just got worse and worse I was going out every day this is where I was in a small town of Northampton everyone knew me everyone knew me as Geordie Dan so everyone knew me like it's just you know that small town mentality like yeah. everyone knows everyone sort of thing so I ended up grafting anyway and I, I ended up getting a fucking heavy round mate a heavy heavy round this was when like that MCAT bubble was was huge do you remember it meow meow 15 years ago yeah, yeah, yeah. so I I ended up getting a barrel, 
right, a big blue barrel of this MCAT before it, just before it went like illegal, I got a barrel of it and it was cheap and cheerful stuff that like, I don't know if you ever had it or anything, but it, it was fucking horrible cat piss shit. But Northampton was a big uni town. So there was a lot of students. So I had a good fucking round going there. Um, so I was grafting for a bit. I was in the rave scene, like I said. I started DJing. Um, met a guy who was a big DJ in um, the hardcore scene, who's a Glaswegian, actually. He's a massive DJ called Joey Riot. I'm not sure if you've heard of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Big shout, Joey Riot. Yeah, <laughs> so he sort of took me under his wing, right? And he was good. He was well-respected, and he was always going to us. I was being a dickhead again. So he taught me everything I knew. Now, how we started was I was personal training in the gym and he wanted to lose some weight and I wanted to learn how to make music. I wanted to learn how to produce music. So I was with him all the time. We were sort of exchanging, exchanging sessions for sessions and stuff like that. And obviously I was grafting and he would, he would want some stuff to take to his gigs and stuff like that sometimes. So you could have it, have it, mate. Do you know what I mean? I was doing that good. I was like, oh, you'd be like, oh, can you come round? I'd just be like, chucking him like cues and it. Go on, have it, have it. Whatever, pills, cork, whatever the fuck I was grafting at the time. And um, and I was, I mean, I was killing it, to be fair. Like, I was doing really well. I wouldn't say well, but. So then I got, I started to get caught with all that. I had a good run. I did have a good run. Do you always get fucking caught, mate? Always, always, always. <laughs> Always. This is why you have to have that about you to know when to stop. Yeah. I oh, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, oh, don't do it, yeah. It's a bit hard though, isn't it? You've got to make yeah. a quid somehow, aren't you? Yeah. So, I was doing, because I was going to these raves, I weren't getting searched. I'd go in with my big DJ bag and I'd just like say the name Jordy. I went by DJ Jordy, but not spelled Jordy as in Newcastle Jordy, spelled like Jo D, mm -hmm. like a bit. Rah, a bit hardcore sounding, isn't it? So I went, so I'd just walk in and be like, yeah, Jordi, they'd be like, all right, cook up, go straight in, no searching. And we'd be DJing in, in clubs like O2 Academies. Like they're not little, little dingy clubs. They were big, big clubs. And then the, where was I at there? Yeah, bringing the gear in. Oh yeah, clubs. so I'm taking the gear in and I'm killing it, mate, because I'm, I'm grafting like, and I'm a DJ, so everyone knows who you are. So everyone would like prefer to get it off you rather than get it off like some random on, on, on the floor, do you know what I mean? And then there was a guy quite high up within the scene, yeah, like promoter level, yeah, of big, big, big raves. And he was from like the Liverpool area and he was like, I'll tell you what, right, there's this story when my daughter was born. Fucking bad me. Right, so my daughter... She was being born in Wigan Hospital. So I've sort of missed a few bits there why, why I've ended up in Wigan. But I met a bird when I was in the army. <coughs> you, when we were in training, I met a bird. And um, we were together for a bit. The only reason we split up was I was going to Germany and she was going to a different camp. Um, and we ended up meeting up at some point in Northampton uh, after she got out of the army and after I'd been kicked out. And we were together for a little bit. She ended up getting pregnant and she was from Wigan. So she she went back to Wigan and I was just in Northampton. And I'm like, I can't leave Northampton because I was I was making like five to ten grand a week. You know what I mean? I was like, and you can't say no. Even though they've got, at one point I'd have like 40, 50 grand just chilling in my microwave. But I could still not say no to it. I think it was more like... The buzz? Yeah, like, like get it off me. Like, I'm the man sort of thing. Big bit pathetic when you think about it now now i've switched on with myself but it was like you can't i have to be around i have to go to these parties i have to go to these ways like you have to get your stuff off me i was a big spender and because you couldn't put it i didn't have a clue about business and then you couldn't put your money in a bank i couldn't do anything like that because that's how you get caught so i was just grafting it on like trainers holidays like just cash is king like just just splashing it just spending it like, so I've, made, I've still got some of the clothes and the because if you buy a good pair of trainers or a good pair of clothes, they can last you a long time if you don't wear them like constantly. So I've still got some of the like special edition like Nike trainers I was paying like six hundred quids and stuff for. You know what I mean? I've still got them under my bed. Still good, good condition and that. Um, so my kids being born, my eldest, she's being born in um, Wigan Hospital, and this guy I was telling you about the 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 guy who's quite high up within the scene promoter of some big events he he 
I had the bat, the best stuff from the Liverpool area. I had like the, the sickest. So I'm speaking to him anyway, and he's like, where, where? I'm like, I'm in Wigan. He's like, ah, I can come meet you. I was like, I'm at Wigan Hospital. So as my kid was being born, he come into the hospital. Yeah, passed me two ounces of fucking sniff. Stashed it wherever, stashed it, and went back to my daughter being born. And I'll never forget that. I'm just chilling there with midwives and that around. I've got two ounces of, of sniff down me down my box. It's like the, the stinky stuff as well, like the really, really good stuff. Like clay shit. And then when my daughter was born, there was a big rave on the next day, and I was like, I need to go to this because this was my this rave was my sort of the big the first time I'd got on a big event. It was a big event and I had to go. So I like basically watched my daughter be born, spent like five, six hours with her and then fucked off to Skegness to go to this rave. Um, and this is how I got in with that, that guy who was quite high up in the rave. So then I started dealing with his links and getting it all off the boys in Liverpool. Um, large amounts, large amounts of MDMA, Coke, Ket, the, the fucking lot. Like I owed a lot of money out. And <coughs> this was where... It's been a good couple of years at this point, but this was where my life just started to go fucking. I've had the ups. You go up, you've, you must come down. It happens. It happens with fucking everyone. So everything started going wrong. So I got pulled over. I got pulled over randomly for being on my phone. Searched the car. I don't know why I didn't stash it. I forgot it was there. So they've opened the door and there was like a couple hundred pills and there were... um there were blue ghosts that were called. And uh, he goes, what are these? I'm like, Viagra? He's like, that's not, it's got a fucking ghost on it. That's not Viagra, you know, it's black. They got nicked anyway. And because Northampton Crown Court was um, quite a big court for big stuff. So like, you know, when that baby P murder killing was going on, it was all going through, through Northampton Crown Court. So my case just kept getting pushed aside. It wasn't, wasn't big enough, just kept getting pushed aside. One thing what happened as well, like, they took a good hundred off the count of pills. This is what I didn't get. Why? And let's say there was 250 there. They were like, there's only, there's 150 there. And I'm like... Class here. Yeah, I'm like, there's not 150 there at all. You've fucking pocketed 100. Do you know what I mean? So whoever nicked it wasn't very legit anyway, because they put a different number on. Um, so it went on and on anyway. And like I said, small town mentality. I'd just be driving and bailed. I'm just be driving and pulled over randomly. Your car's not insured. I was like, your car is insured? What are you talking about? Took my car off us. Next day I get a phone call. Yeah, yeah, come pick your car up. I was like, well, I'm not being charged for the, the uh, alleged no insurance. Oh, no, no, no. It's all good. Were you good? I thought, you f think I'm thick, don't they? Like, they don't obviously done something to the car. So I fucking give that car away straight away. Got another car next minute and pulled over again. Because they're recognising us. They're recognising my face and they're going, ooh. And then they're pulling me over, they're searching the car. Like I'm having to get, make phone calls, get out the car, walk 100 metres, make the phone calls. Man, I was a paranoid mess. I was a fucking paranoid yeah, that's mess. that's all the drugs. What, they, what happened with the 200 to get you jail? No, I didn't get jail. So it went on for four years. It went on for four years and it, it, it worked in my favour because there was MCAT as well. Well, that was class B. So I pleaded guilty to the class B and not to the class A. I said the class A is mine, it's personal. It's my shit that I take pills. I, I weren't at this point, I was I was being quite clever with taking the stuff at this point. Cause I used to just like, go turn up, ring someone and say, come on man, come on, free drugs. And I just have like a, a, sorry, like a mug, they're filled with like cork. And I would just like grab a spoon and go, mm that anyone who come round like it was, it was uh, days on end days on end so you get away with that one kind of kind of kind of but didn't i did get charged but because it went on for so long like i say everything was going back down 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 and i went to um i went to amsterdam and i took i'd take stuff over there but we'd get we'd get buses from victoria over to fucking Cali and then a different bus to fucking wherever the fuck we were going. And so you didn't have to go on the plane with it. Like, shit like that. We drove to Croatia. Me and my mate Mike, MC Enemy, we drove to Croatia one day. He weren't doing it. He weren't doing that like that. He was a performer. Like, but 
I was like, come on, let's do a fucking drive. And I'm like filling that car up with, with shit while we go to this festival in Croatia. And I was doing shit like that. But anyway, I go to Amsterdam, me thinking I'm Billy Big Bollocks, they're not going to search me. I'm uh, DJing in this club called The, the Melkweg in Amsterdam. <clears throat> And I'm in the, I've got a little man bag on it, and I'm in the toilet, and I'm with this guy, and I'm having a bit of fuck. Because not even, like, trying to hide it, just right in the open of the toilet. So this security guard comes in, and he's like, you come here. So let me search your bag. I'm like, no chance. I'm like, fucking no, I'm you not. And he puts me in this room, and I got nicked. And because I had so much on us, the, the drug charges aren't that bad out there, but because I had that much on us, I had, like, an ounce of coke, an ounce of MDMA, all bagged up, all fucking bagged up. You know what I mean? It was bang to rights. So I ended up in jail in Amsterdam for two weeks. Fucking two weeks out there. But what happened with this one was my ex at the time, who had had the kid with, she was pregnant. So she was pregnant with my son. And I was using a solicitor who was, we couldn't speak directly, but she would speak. Now, so she was putting in a like, I I'm alone. I need him. I'm about to give birth. I've got an 18 month old daughter. Like I need him here. So I end after two weeks, I ended up getting bailed. And I tell you what, it was fucking horrific in that jail. It was mental. Like you'd spend 23 hours a day locked up. They obviously they didn't really, there was one woman who was all right. I was like, give me a book or something like that. One guy come and he, he threw me a book in a different language. It was like, can you not give me it's an English book? So this woman comes back and she throws me Pete Burns' autobiography. Do you remember him? Yeah, you spin me. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, really, mate? I was like, honest. I was like, fuck it. And I read it. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Good autobiography. That's probably the first book I'd ever read in my life. So I was like, I was like, anyway, I read, read that book. She had this solicitor. She ended up getting me um, bailed because they don't bail foreigners. That's why I was in there. I mean, they were feeding, they were not what they were feeding us obviously mass produced bread and butter already buttered in a in a packet like a an open packet frozen so in the morning they'd just come and throw me this bread and butter frozen so they'd wake me up and i'd have to wait for it that's what we were eating that's what they were giving us to eat just frozen bread and butter wow. yeah what happens then when you get out like once you stopped all selling the drugs and that how did you end up in the gay porn scene so i weren't making any money i was mm. on the door i was on the door and then um, this girl I know from the rave scene, she was a dominatrix and she was on adult work and the camming and all that sort of stuff. So she was working in Blackpool and she was telling me about um, about uh, this guy she knows who does gay porn, but he's straight. And I was like, oh, well, I can't do that. I was like, you mad? I was like, I can't fucking do that. I was like, nah. And then, like I said, the, the best thing I ever done, the best thing I've ever done in my life was learning to not give a fuck what other people thought. Like, I've always been that guy, oh, what would this person think, what would that person And I just thought, when I was here, I was like, this was me starting fresh again, a new life, all over again in Blackpool. I thought, I couldn't give a fuck. I'm surrounded by box, good boxers. I'm surrounded by good people who were egging me on to train and, like, not people, like, telling me to come out and stuff like that. I just had no money. I just had no money, and I was in the gym. And I got, funny enough, not long after that conversation with her, I got poached by a guy to do some modelling for a gay porn magazine, not a gay magazine, that was it. And he's offered me 750 quid. So I'm like, oh, fucking yeah. All right, and then it went from like that to will you do a wank on sc on the screen? So I was like, yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll do that. It went up to a grand or something. And then he was like, would you ever do gay? I was like, I, I can't do that. And he went, listen, hear me out, hear me out. He was like, it's not what you think. He's like, look, all I need you to do is just pretend so basically just dry humping this guy and you know, give me a grand for him, right? Just act. That's so what he's like, just act. He went, and then when it come together and they pieced it together, what he'd done was, because like, let's say the camera's right there, he got somebody else's penetration with the hard dick and he just edited it. So he edited someone else's dick to make it look like it was going in. Do you know what I mean? Like the editing skills. So I was like, this is fucking easy. I was like, I can definitely do this. But this guy was a bit of a dick. Um, and he would ring his, want you on Thursday, I'd take the day off work, and then he wouldn't respond for days on end. I'm like, what's happening on the day? And nothing. Three days later, oh, sorry, mate, I had a, had a bad time. I was like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with this guy anymore. So I, I knew, since going on Twitter, I knew what 
the straight man was in gay in the gay world. It's like gold dust. For some reason, gay men love straight men. It's like a challenge, I think. So I knew my worth at this point. So I just Googled the top gay porn companies in the world. So come up one, one to ten. Lucas Entertainment. So I looked on it, I was like, apply. Da, da, da. Within a within a week, a couple of days, I got a phone call. Um, can you can you do a Skype? It's like yeah, cool. So I done the Skype with him. He's like, let me see your eyes. Are they your real eyes? <laughs> I was like, yeah. did you ever see the? There was a Channel Five documentary I done called the, the Sex Business. Yeah. Did you watch it? No, I seen clips of it. Right. Well, he was that was that company then. <clears throat> so, anyway, he's like, can you take your pants off? This is all on Skype. Get hard. I was like, oh, he went, no, it's all right, you've got a couple of minutes. I was like, oh, shouting me bird. I'm sat on the stairs, I'm like, suck me off. I'm like, suck me off. I was like, I need to get out, suck me off. She said, what, what? And I was like, just do it. <laughs> so I went back hard and he was like, right, good, spin around, blah, blah, blah. Right, next minute, and then the next day, I had a three year contract in my inbox. Sign this, uh, you'll come to Mexico on such and such date. It was like a week later, I spent two weeks in Mexico. So I'm like, are you going to get a grander scene? I was like, right, this is fucking perfect. I was like, this is fucking... Blah, blah. Anyway, he tells me to log in. He tells me to log in and watch some of the stuff. Like, now, that's not for me, that. So anyway, I watched it and I was like, this is hardcore. Like, this was real shit. There was no faking involved in this one. This was hardcore. I was like, I don't think I can fucking do this. And I thought, right, fuck it, anyway, I'm going to Mexico. I was like, I'll tell them there when I get there. I can't do it. Let's get the get the holiday first. And I ain't going to spend two weeks. I was skin. I'm fucking skin, so I might at least get the holiday. So when I get there, he didn't tell me this, but when I get there, they use a uh, jab, to so jab you in the dick, called Trimix. Super, super strength, like erectile dysfunction medication. You can only really get it in America, but it fucking works. So the second that goes in, you just massage it, and within a minute, you're pointing to the moon. You could go nowhere. So that I was like, oh shit, I was like, I can crack on now. I can like just do the job what I'm supposed to do without having to be aroused. It didn't matter what, what I looked at because it can be off-putting when you're looking down because it's a man and I have no disrespect to anyone who does like that, but it's not my thing. So when I'm looking down, I'm like, oh, but then it's just acting and within America, it's all about energy, uh, which is like mourning. Not notice the American porn stars are way more like, cringy than than oh yeah so we're all about this energy and it was just like ah like shit like that <laughs> so i was doing it anyway and i was good at it but because i was like the only straight man the only british man full of tattoos like heterosexual looking like it, i was like gold dust to this company so i was proper diva in it i want more money i want more scenes i want i want this that and the other and um, because one guy tried to get in my bed with us like we were all in this in this villa we're all like sharing kind of rooms and there's like four people in a room or something like that. This guy climbs in my bed. Starts, and I'm like, go mental, screaming, two o'clock in the morning, the, the, the guy who owns the company is like, what's going on? I'm not having this. I'm like, do you know what I mean? They must have just thought he must, he must be a little bit gay or, or I'm blagging it or something like that. A lot of people pretend to be straight because they can get more money, but you can't pretend to be straight. If, you, if there's camp guys pretending to be straight. You just can't pull it off. Yeah. Do you know but what I mean? There's obviously going to be question marks to be doing gay porn or doing... Always. Kissing guys, sucking guys, Always. whatever the fuck it is. And you're going to thinking, is he? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. like how is that feeling then to be straight, got a missus to then be doing gay porn? Is that just to block it out? Like, it was the money. It was, was the, the money. fucking money. I needed the money. It was a grand, it was a grand scene. And like when I went to Mexico for them two weeks, I had, I had 10 scenes lined up. Much a scene. A grander scene. What was it like your first scene? It was it was hard. It was hard, but I met this lad, he was quite cool, American dude. And we went out for a drink the night before and he's like, Look, all you need to do is just energy, just moan. Don't look at the camera. Nowhere in the camera. Like he was really telling me through it all. And when I'd done it, I bossed that first scene. Like the, the, the guy was buzzing with us, the guy who owned it, he was like, right, cool. Um absolutely buzzing. But it was quite like mentally challenging, let's say to do it but once i'd done about five six scenes i was like i knew what to do i knew like when you watch that channel five thing there's a thing there's a point at one point where the they go cut 
and it's an it's a fucking big orgy. There's five lads, so they go cut, and these lads carry on. They're still like necking on with each other, and you just see me like kind of go grab my phone, and I'm just sat there like you have to stay where you are because the cam. Let's just say the changing batteries on the camera. You still have to stay where you are because otherwise you've got to be in this. It would look weird, wouldn't it? Coming back to it if you've moved spots, so. I had to stay where I was, and then as soon as they go, camera's rolling, I just throw my phone, and it's like, ah, back into it, like straight back into the character. So I could get into character good. I was good at the job. And when people used to go to those, I mean, you look like you're enjoying it. I was like, good, because I'm good at what I do. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm good. This is how I ended up getting into the straight stuff, because I knocked all that on the head, because that stuff I'm telling you about, I'd done it for a couple of years. I'd made a lot of money, mate. I made a fucking lot of money from it, because OnlyFans, I started before OnlyFans become a thing. So I was all over Twitter. I grew a following of up to like 90K. Do you know what I mean? Then OnlyFans come about. Like, I weren't doing much OnlyFans, just a little bit. So I couldn't be asked. I, I seen OnlyFans as not making money. I wanted the money, get paid, get the, do the job, get the money, not make some content and then potentially get some money. Because I seen that making content as not working. It was too, I couldn't cross the barriers from porn to, to OnlyFans. So I was just doing the poem, but I was making a lot of money, mate. I was making a fucking shit ton of money, which put me in a good position um, to get out of me. I was living in this shitty, piss stinking flat with nothing. I had nothing, mate. Like, I could barely go and see my kids because I couldn't afford to get to see them in Wigan. So I was getting trains to them, couldn't afford it. Like, I couldn't have them come to mine because the flat was a danger to them. It was like radiators hanging off it was rank mate it was fucking mm. rank then i started making some money my bird she knew all about it as soon as i got into the pond i was already with her so i told her she was someone i'd met in the gym prior I told her what i'm doing she was like yeah cool she's like you're not gay i know you're not gay so that's what you're gonna go and do that's what you're gonna go and do so it's mad that isn't it because if i was with a bird then and like if she gets sleeps with a guy you're gonna go off your nut but if it was with a bird you'd be thinking ah fuck it <laughs> isn't it? it's weird the way the fucking mind does but for you like God. Then doing the boxing, being in the army, causing trouble, in and out of jail, selling drugs, to then being on that gay scene. Like, how hard is that for you to try and go fuck it? Because obviously you must have got a lot of stick from family, friends, and people thinking that he's living a lie. Mate. <clears throat> so the rave scene found out first. So I was quite well known in the rave scene. I was grafting, I was a big DJ. Because um, I had DJs all over the world, mate. Bifa, Magaloff, Toronto. I got booked in Japan at one point. I didn't go, but I got booked in Japan like a some quite big gigs so quite a few people knew who i was and then somebody found out and they made the memes that do you know what i mean it was just <laughs> flying around it was flying around the northeast uh, makina scene i was telling you about it was flying around the hardcore scene like these memes these everyone taking the piss like and it got to us it did get to us bad um I don't know why. Uh, this was before I'd learned to not give a fuck. It was around about this time I'd done it. I just thought, you know what? Just fucking embrace it. Just, this is what I'm doing. Why am I asked about what some people who who were acquaintances a few years ago are now thinking about me? Made a new Facebook. Fucked them off. Fucked that Facebook off. Blah, blah, blah. Had no on this Facebook. I wasn't seeing raves and stuff to make me go, ooh, I want to rave. I was just seeing like posts from boxers and other stuff that was making me go and training hard and me think this is what i need to do to be because i wanted at this point whatever i've done whatever i've put my hand to i've ended up getting quite big at it as soon as i started producing music and that joey took me under his wing showed me i think i got quite good at it so then when i started boxing i was like I'm, this is my next one this is the next chapter of my life i'm gonna do something i, I was like i'm not gonna go far i was like but i'm gonna fight on some big shows and stuff was that, like that. too then but doing the gay scene where people think ah fuck him this and that to then boxing as if to balance out look i'm still a tough man like they were both the same time literally as i started boxing i started doing the mm -hmm. the thingy well no, the I, boxing was before that about, about a week yeah. two weeks something like that like mm -hmm. very very close together and i told everyone in the gym brian rose and that i told them all and they were just like i, I just thought but people shocked Yes and no, because if you knew me as a person, if you knew me well enough, you you wouldn't be surprised. Mm. It's not as if there was rumours before it in the army, you fucking it, sucking off guys, no, or you no, doing no, this, no, like there's that. suspicion. It's just a case of you being in the army and out of jail to then fucking do it. Well, there was a lot on. of girls who I'd been with in like Northampton or whatever like that. And when things were going around Northampton, people, these girls were like, he's not fucking gay. Well, if he is, like he's, he's, 
he's done, he's he's well. done well because yeah because it's not as if you're, you're fucking doing these scenes it's not as if it's blatantly there so why would you fucking hide that I know but it was like, but it is, a, it is a mad thing to think that a straight is. man doing that it's mad you obviously you've got acting maybe guys kiss stuff like that that's understandable I had to do all but to that. then go full blown what was the worst kind of stuff you had to do the kissing the kissing so for the for the Lucas Entertainment we had to kiss now I was like look I'm not putting a dick in my mouth <laughs> 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 the first scene I'd done because I desperately needed the money it's like I'd fucking sold my soul this and this was the one because I was like I don't mind like look I'm getting hard but putting I've got bad gag reflexes mate I'm telling you bad so they were like just try that but just try it and I thought I need the fucking money so I, I can't be going home empty handed yeah I'd already figured out what I was spending the money on like I owed money out to people and not only that I had to sort my life out like I said I was living in a fucking shithole like I had to so I had to get some money get a car sort my life out like and I just kept thinking I'm gonna be able to provide for my kids soon because I'm gonna get this money and that's all what I was like really worried about was not just being a shit dad because I'm not saying my, my dad wasn't a shit dad at all but I didn't see him I didn't see him when I went to Newcastle. It's not his problem. It was like my my mum's problem. I would we would travel and see each other sometimes, but it weren't a lot. So I always thought like I'm always going to be there for my for my kids because I knew what it was like not having my actual dad around. So I was like I'm I'm going to be there for them, and that's how I was thinking. It is the 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 money the the this is going to change my life effectively changing the kids' life. So he wanted me to suck a dick. So anyway, I've put it in my mouth and I've just went, and I've just fucking threw up everywhere, everywhere. I had to stop the set, clean up, everyone get changed, showered, everything. He was like, right, no more dick for Jordy, no more, no more sucking dick for Jordy. Just, just you, do you don't need to do it. I was like, fuck, fuck for that. That was the problem. But I had to kiss. So when you can feel like, you know, you've got a bit of stubble in that. When you can feel it on the mouth, that was on. But I've got to stay in character. I've got to be enjoying it because I'm acting so I'm I'm having to like uh, and I'm used to say to them all all the time I'd be like just before it would start I'd be like no tongue I was like do not put your tongue in my mouth so it would just be like the lips no tongue that was my rule do not put your tongue in my mouth because I would just stop and then that would ruin the the, the camera cameras rolling you may as well because I got to the point where I realised how it was the longer they made you the, the camera guy stop and do stuff the longer the scene would go so I would try and remember what we were going to do, the transitions, the where we start and where we end and where the comf scene is going to be. And I would try and bang it all out in one one take. So I would go, right, we're transitioning from, see, we start off here and then he starts sucking or whatever. I would then go, right, the next, I'll be thinking the next transition is him bent over there because you had to do stills first. So you went through, you'd speak through what the positions would be and then they would get stills and it would be fake cum and you'd be like, like for the still pictures because you couldn't do the stills after because you'd either be sweating I mean, they make up to you and everything like put high level productions these in villas and like all, all luxurious places around the world like must have cost them a fortune but then what's he making that's what my question was yeah. what the fuck are you making because mm -hmm. I know what I was being paid I know how much it cost me to get there and I'm thinking there's 40 models here we're in a massive villa that's costing a bomb so um was yeah. anybody in the same position as you? No. Doing it for money? Doing it to try and provide? Everyone who I worked with on that company, they were all gay. That's the only straight one. How do you think your kids now, obviously you're, you're not thinking then, you just want to try and provide, get a better house to try and give them what they can. Because I had Sophie Anderson on the porn stand, she done escort and she done porn, everything, to try and provide their kid with the material stuff. But now they've kind of hit a wobble where... The kids at school and he's kind of getting teased that yeah do you think that can affect your kids as they get older well my kids are going to know how to handle themselves so <laughs> yeah. they'll be able to crack them but um no because what i was thinking at the time i did think that a few times i did think is that is it going to affect them but the way the world is moving more and more things are becoming acceptable some really weird things are becoming norm normal so I thought by the time they're old enough to even understand what porn is, either I'm going to be way past that or the world's going to be ch totally changed. I don't want to be like politically incorrect here, but some people don't know whether the, the male, whether the female, yeah, like the, true, the, yeah. the, they, they're going through some very mental ba barriers. But I thought as things are getting more, this was unheard of 10, 15 years ago, it was 
even even when I was a kid, being gay was quite. Yeah, nobody uh, speaks out. I yeah. believe that's why a lot of people, a lot of men struggle with their mental health. I believe a lot of men are. I know. Gay or bisexual, where they're just too embarrassed, they're ashamed. Even in this day, well, you've, we've only got one footballer that's ever come out as gay, and I think that was only a few weeks ago. That. Like, it's sad today. I don't. I don't give a fuck who you are. I've got many gay friends and they're the best cunts in the, mm. on the world. Yes, they're a bit fucking crazy and fruity when they're drunk, but I'm not asked. Just, just, just know your boundaries. Yeah, yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Give her two fucks. Yeah. Like, just as long as you're not hurting anybody, like be who you want to be. In this, as long as you're not hurting, as long as you're not forcing your agenda onto people, because I think we're living in a, a place where if people don't go with their own agenda, then they start turning on you. Everybody sees the world differently. Like, I believe there's male, female, two genders. That's it. But if you want to change or do mm, that, then that's do that. you. Yeah, then that's you. That. So who fucking cares? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, don't yeah. Force me but, and say, well, but we're this and that. Or I want to be it. a panda or an elephant or a fucking. I want to identify as the moon. Fucking do it. But I don't. Don't uh, push it onto yeah, me. It's like vegan, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, when yeah. vegans push yeah, vegan, isn't it? Just yeah. everything is this and that. We're all, we're all see the world just a little differently. Like, yeah. How did you? So were you shagging guys in that then? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean? But I, you weren't getting shagged. Out of no, I was the top. I was. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the. Yeah, I'm, I'm the. I'm, I'm the stabber. Did man. that make you feel more? But it was like more manly though. The, uh, like you never really lost your femininity so in the in the straight world. That's just fucking weird to everyone, right? But in the gay world, you're like an alpha, like an alpha top. Like it's, especially when you look like, I don't want to say I look like I, I do, but you know what I mean? Like full of tattoos, quite muscular. Like it's, they would just call you like, the one term I didn't like was daddy. Oh, daddy. I'd be like, don't, because yeah. I am a daddy. Like it's not, not. Yeah. And then they just start calling you alpha sort of thing. Like people... People with mental money, man. Like this one guy in the New York, he works at the New York Stock Exchange. He's in his 80s, yeah? He's a consultant in the Stock Exchange. Like he's a powerful, powerful man. Behind closed doors, he's a submissive. And he like calls me master, sends me like, he used to just send me like five grand and that. I'd be like, oh, a cunt fuck I used to call him. That's his name, cunt fuck. Because <laughs> he like, they like being degraded. That's what they, they, they're into that but then when they're at work they're these powerful 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 men it's, it's quite weird but he would just send me money left right and center man yeah. I, I still keep in touch with him now and then because i'm i'm in his will yeah. <laughs> so keeping him sweet on it and he's got no family left he's got cousins he's in his 80s like i say and he's got cousins and stuff like that and i'm in his will so i keep in touch with him i get yeah. off all he keep in touch do you with see him. a lot of cd shit though behind the scenes because yeah. the porn industry like i've got friends in the porn industry i love them to bits some of them fucking hate it because of what it, they've turned into it and some of them still love it yeah i don't like it like yeah I like it it's um it does open your eyes like to a whole new world of weirdness like you've got to think how a man and a, how a man is right us sexually right mm -hmm. can be quite ruthless at times just want to like think with your dick blah, blah, blah. and it's usually the woman that like the man will have to try the woman will be saying oh, I'm, I'm not like that blah 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 can you imagine a man and a man they do have no boundaries between each other some gay men and i've seen it coming back or going to these um these scenes in like mexico new york or like I, mean, we, I was filming in scenes all over the fucking world mate it was quite it was good but obviously the the job wasn't very good it wasn't very but it was an all right sort of life style and you would see these guys on planes and they would just make eye contact so two gay lads would just go like that and that's it they're in there banging like they all they need to do is make eye contact and sort of mentally agree to it with each other like the man and the man is quite ruthless. Yeah, it's easier to sleep with each other. Yeah, they just look the they're, they're ruthless, mate. They're ruthless. Yeah. And I've do you seen get tested that. a lot? Yeah, bad tested. You have to you have to have a fresh cert. Like if you rack up and you ain't got a fresh cert or, or something like that, man, you're gone. You're not on set. See you later. Do you know what I mean? Like probably make you pay pay yourself to get home. You've got to have a fresh cert and it's gotta be can't just be the text from the gum clinic. It's gotta be a privately done certificate, like a cert. So they usually cost, you go to the ordinary gum clinic, they're about 40 quid. If you go to some private sex hospitals, you could be paying three, 400 quid just for your testing. Yeah. But Did yeah. anybody ever get, come back, dodge a result where you think, fuck me, man, that could be me. Like, um, it's a fucking... Uh, yeah, so there was one guy who I worked with, right, who I got told about three days later, like he was HIV positive, right? Mate, it fucked me up, big style. But there's this medication you can take called PrEP. I don't know if you've heard of it, right? And it basically eliminates HIV. So if you've got 
HIV, let's say you're positive, for example, you take this stuff, this this prep, and it lowers your count so much that you can't pass it on. Right? That it's pretty much impossible for you to pass it on. Now, the person who's negative takes a different kind of prep. It's the same sort of thing, but it's just a different batch. They take that, and let's say you were positive, but you weren't on medication, but I was taking this. I can't get it either. Like, it's it's not happening. It's clinically tested. If that was to happen and you were to get it, you would get big payout. Like, it's that unlikely it's going to happen. So when I found out about this, lost my head. I kicked off a big fuss. It was on the first production I was on. I was going mental. I, I refused to do any more scenes. I just chilled out in Mexico, went home, got tested, didn't tell anyone. I was dreaming about it. I was waking up thinking about it. It really fucked me up for a good week. And then as soon as I come back, got tested negative. And I was like, right, okay, that stuff clearly works. And that prep. And if you look into it, prep, P-R-E-P, -E it is legit. Like, you was know. that always a concern for you, though, being a straight man and then fucking guys? Yeah, it was. I'm not going to lie, it was. Um, it, always that. But it was the money again. And then I'm like, is the money worth having this? What if this happens? And I was always thinking about it. But so long as you're careful, it, it's just got a bad rep, the porn scene, hasn't it? But the fucking super tested like the likes of sophie anderson and rebecca moore them them sort of levels they're getting tested fortnightly mm -hmm. fortnightly they're getting tested like but sophie anderson's partner at the time when they were doing the cock destroyers they um they were getting tested fucking god knows how many times because they were so them cock destroyers blew up do you remember them yeah, they were talking about it. I had Sophie Anderson on. She just yeah. really went mega. You should get Rebecca on. I'll put you on to her. She, yeah, I'll have her on. Yeah. Um, so them, I, I, well, anyway, so I done this Channel 5 thing. So when, when you were saying about before, like, was it difficult? Like, so when I was in Blackpool, this was my life now. So the only person I cared about giving a fuck about was anybody who was in my life. All them in the rave scene, fuck them. You're mm -hmm. you're in the past now. I'm not asked about you. It's what you think about me. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this now. So I thought I'm going to have to tell everybody in the gym. I'm going to have to tell everyone in Blackpool because it's the internet. And Blackpool's a gay town. It's quite a big gay town, Blackpool. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of gay people. And you see the flags all over the place. So I thought I'm going to have to say something. So I, I started telling everyone. And I was on, funny enough, back to that first charge where I got caught with the pills, um, that dragged on for four years. By the time it come to actually getting seen to, I had changed my life around. I was living in Blackpool. I was training, um, I was working out of Brian Rose's gym. Um, I was training, the, so which is mad. I went from one year of participating in um, ultra white collar boxing to a year later teaching them because I started working in, I started working, but I worked in one gym over the road. I fought that off. It was a big, change gym the, the gym group i fucked them off i went over to brian's took all my clients with us to brian's come in there and because i was getting padding by like bobby rimmer big pro coach like i was i can do this and then it'll be like someone will come in and i'll be like come on let's do a bit of padding. and i just got better and better and better and then brian said to us because bobby's not a, bobby's not a, uh he's a pro coach it's not up to him to teach you turn that jab over keep that like it's not he's past that he's a pro trainer he's like training people who already know that so brian physically pulled me to a side and he was like you've got something new he was like i can see it in you he was like because i was progressing quite quick he was like you've got you've got what it takes he's like i want he's like i want you even though this was his gym he's like i want you to go to sharp style which was an amateur gym he says i want to speak i want you to speak to a guy called tom scott right who he knew well He's a fucking blinding coach. Like, he's like, go and, go and see him. Now, I was fighting that Friday. I hadn't spoken to Tom yet. I was fighting that Friday, and I'm, I seen him there. He was His bird was boxing, and he was warming her up. And I says, he went, no, I'm warming you up. I said, nah, I ain't, I ain't got anyone here with us. I went, come on. So he started warming us up. Within seconds, he went, you need to twist that over, mate. You're not fully extending. You need, And he's like... I was like, I need to get in with you. And he went, come down next week. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll do something with you. And me and him like, went like that then. We like, just gelled, me and him. So I, I had the money, mate. I was, I was doing the porn then. I had, the, I had quite a good, I had good money. So I was seeing these like, top coaches every day, Monday to Friday, every single day. They were paying 100, 150 a week. I, didn't, I wasn't asked. I was just paying it just to get the better. And I was training with Tom for a good year and a half. And I was fighting under him. We'd done 
fucking well. I think I went undefeated one day, um, to be fair. And then um, I did lose a fight against uh, an ex-pro called Martin King. What was that feeling like? Um, I weren't asked. I weren't asked because I didn't want to lose, obviously. But I got the call three weeks. Will you fight this? But they all knew I didn't want. I didn't want journeyman. I always used to say, "Do not give me a journeyman because I don't want to go in there knowing I'm supposed to win this fight." I get no pride out of that. I, I have to. I want to. I like not but like being the underdog and proving but, everyone wrong. Do you feel as if that's been your whole life, though? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, do you know what? I've just believed in myself when I was doing the music. I believed in myself. Mm. I still do the music now. I'm never going to go and DJ again because the lifestyle was horrific. Like I said, I was getting on it all the time, but I've still got my studio at home. I still make music because that's what I'm passionate about. I'm, yeah. I'm super love music. It's my thing, like even more than boxing. But boxing keeps me on the fucking straight, straight line. Narrow. How were you treated though? Like saying you're a straight man to being in gay porn to then, like, how did you feel as if you constantly had to justify yourself? Yeah not re right how did you deal with that some people what i done was like i said before that that i got on to t teach i'm fucking babbling now aren't i so when i was teaching that white collar the i ended up getting a letter or recognition or whatever of brian and ultra white collar boxing to say i had took part in teaching the white ultra white collar boxing and i had helped raise like 50 grand for cancer research this was all going in my favor for for when i went to court i turned my life around i've moved out of the area i've i've i'm hel helping charities i'm i'm do you know what i mean so it i ended up getting community service so when i was on community service and that i would just be the first because everyone knew it's a small again small town mentality with black people everyone knew each other so everyone knew what i'd done but i was the first to take the piss out of myself if a joke ar ar arised i would be the one to like take the piss out of myself and just tell everybody what i'd done i remember meeting jack armfield another boxer big big name boxer from blackpool he was on community service for something for something he had done um and he got banned from boxing because of it or suspended from boxing because of it and then um, i'm in there and someone's like asking what he does for a living so he's like what and i tell him and he's like F he's laughing his head off he's like fuck off and I'm like, I'm serious. He's like, I don't, he's like, you have, you are all having me on. So I was like, and he's like, oh, he's like, what the fuck? But like, they all respected us for speaking about it rather than just being caught out. Because like I say, the rave scene found out first. At this point, I thought, I don't care about yous. What I do care about is everyone within boxing. So I just started telling everyone, yeah, this is what I do. Even Brian said to us at one point, he's like, I admire you. He's like, because you're doing what you need to do to earn, earn money. He fuses the situation as well. I so they can have anything against you. Listen, it's not the fucking worst case scenario, but again, it's like, legal. Did you have, obviously, if you're doing, um, being the straight man, being in gay porn, did you ever have the so called straight men ever try and approach you and try and fucking put it on you? Uh, yeah. Ones who are married and shit? Yes. Yes. Now, because even though you're saying that I'm not this and that, in their mind they're thinking lying yeah, bastard. Because, because I am, yeah, yeah. mate. Quite, <clears throat> quite common, you know. <clears throat> quite like Philip Schofield shit. Proper common, mate. That's not just a one-off. That that's uh, because back then, when they were like, say, the generation above me, like in the 40s i'm 34 now the ones in the 40s like the 50s they couldn't come out back then it weren't normal they've built lives they've built wives houses children they just can't and i'd be getting these messages all the time and i'm like i'm like i'm sorry mate but and they're like yeah, yeah but like 500 quid and i'm like i can't like i'm not the porn star that injection was the porn star because without that injection i weren't getting it up Simple as that. So when people are like, oh, you're an amazing porn star. I'm like, well, but I'm not. Because without that, I can't do the job. Do you know what I mean? There's other porn stars who would have been, and they would have been gay. But like I say, I just told everybody. I did get a lot of people, a, a few handful of people who would be like super against it. And I remember this one guy in Blackpool constantly messaging us, you gay can't make this. Like, I'm going to fucking do this. I want to do that. And the more I think about it, I'm like, he's gay. yeah, he's fucking angry, cunt. You're yeah. not arse. And I'm yeah. like, I know why he's all like this because I've got the balls to go, I'll fuck a fucking man for money. Yeah, I'll fucking do that. I'll do that. 
and they haven't got the balls to just come out about their own life. That's their sexuality. Mm -hmm. Like they are gay, but they can't come out because they're so worried about what you see it all the time. Like a lot of gay people, they say the biggest thing ever for them was like telling the parents, telling people, look, I'm gay. And then once they've done it, it's like, Phew. well, I'm, I'm me now. Do you know what I mean? But some of these people, they're trapped. It's a shame, man. And we look at fucking Elton John. I think George Michael, Freddie Josh Mercury. Michael, I think yeah. they were all married. Yeah. And it's fucking sad. But again, 2022, things aren't moving forward to people to just be themselves. Because when you watch that film of Elton John, mm -hmm. and he's married with his wife, did you married, watch the film? Yeah, yeah. And Fast then someone problem, goes, but you're homosexual. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and then someone goes, is he? And then he goes, would it matter if I was? And they're like, no. And he's like, I'm a homosexual, man. Like, just like that, boom. And then they turned into fucking, fuck it, be, do, be yeah. you then. Do you not hide in yourself, are you? Same happened with my brother. One of my brothers, he's gay. And he was so homophobic when he was younger. Mate, oh, so homophobic. And now he's the campest of the camp. He's fucking gay. He's gay gay. Do you know what I mean? And he, I remember once, remember when pink t-shirts were in? Like, years ago, like pink for cost or something like that. I'd be I still wear fucking pink Yeah, t-shirts. well, it come back again, didn't it? <laughs> so I'll be wearing like pink to go out and map and he'd be like, pink, you fucking puff. Like, like, and then when I found out he was gay, I was like, my dad taught us. And I was like, no. And then obviously I've since getting into the industry, I've realized the more homophobic you are, you are the more likely you are gay. To be I gay, think yeah. that as well, mate. I think mate. that. The more homophobic you are, the, you, they yeah. are gay. Because why are you asked? Who gives a fuck? Who exactly? gives, yeah. If, if you, someone comes to you and goes, I'm gay. All right, cool. I'm not. But, all right, cool. Doesn't stop them being them, does mm -hmm. it? They're still that person. That's still John. That's still like whoever. Do you know what I mean? It's still yeah. that person who you knew anyway. It doesn't change them just because they're, yeah. they're, they're like men behind closed doors mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. So how does a man go from the gay porn scene to then being world champion, bare knuckle boxer? Like that's another two ends of the spectrum, man. Mate, like I say, when I was at Barnes and that with Tom Scott, I put the gra graft in, mate. I put the graft in. Like they say, put the work in, you'll you'll get somewhere. Boxing was getting to the point where, like I said, I took that fight on with on three weeks' notice against the next pro, and I took it because I thought I get beat up for next pro. I'm what. Martin King, experienced as fuck, amateur, fought like Brian Moore's, he fought Jack Armfield, he fought some, some, he beat Mick Hall, funny enough. Mick Hall's a fucking good boxer and he beat Mick Hall. So in my head, I'm going in there like, I have nothing to lose. It was a four rounder, bashing my head to pieces. Touch wood, I've never been knocked out yet and I've not been stopped or anything like that. I have been stopped, sorry, this this one. But it was, he'd done three rounds to the head and I'm just literally like, boom, 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 boom. Head getting rocks all over the place. I was still good. And he thought the final round, he was like, I'm going to his body. He just started ripping into my body. That's when you can't take it, man. You would have had a body shot yourself. Yeah, so fucking horrible, yeah. aren't they? Like, so you take the knee and you've got 10 seconds and I'm like, oh my God, so I get back up again. He comes in, boom, he's obviously just flipped. Body shot and I'm like, oh, I'm done. I'm gonna get back up, and I'm just the ref's just like, you're fucking done. I just couldn't breathe. I just couldn't, you can't get your, your breath back. But I, like I said, I didn't care. You learn. You learn from everyone. Everyone you've had on your podcast will probably say the same thing. You don't lose. You learn. Mm -hmm. And I'm at that level. It's unlicensed. It doesn't matter. He just wanted a final, final fight. Like back, he's retired from pro. There's one more fight, sort of thing. So after that, I knew I'm only getting these fucking hard fights and people are buying tickets and they're coming to watch me get beat because they're ex-pros, the, the, the good leveled people. And after that, I really, really got into MMA. Bad got into MMA. I always look, I stopped watching boxing because it was so corrupt. I started watching these 50-50 fights at MMA. I thought, I want to fucking do this. And I was always the kid who thought, even when I was 20, I'm too old to box. I didn't stop boxing until I was 28. When I walked into that to do ultra, ultra white collar boxing, I was 28. I'd never put a glove on before in my life. And I thought, in these mad couple of years, I've got quite far. I've only been doing it six years now. So, and I'm BKB world champ and I've just beat a fucking killer. Easy. Easily could beat him as well. Like it just, anyway, I went into MMA. I'd done MMA, I had two fights. I thought this really good guy who was from BKB, right? He had fought Franco. He legend. Had, yeah, le legend. <clears throat> he had fought some big names. In, his name was Adam Gorgon. And I fought him in my debut MMA. Well experienced, well experienced. So I stopped the weed on that fight because I'm bad on the weed, fucking so bad. I stopped the weed for that 17 weeks in total. I stopped for that, right? 
ended up going to Connor vs. Khabib in Vegas. Got tickets for that. Do you know who paid for it? Cunt fuck. Cunt fuck they paid for it. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he paid for it. So I was like, I'm on the phone to him, man. I'm like, this got announced. And he's like, master. He's like, I would do anything for my English God. Dude, dude, dude mental, mate. So I'm like, well, I mean, we want to go to Connor Khabib. Flights are this much. Tickets are this much. Like, Five grand dropped to my account. Cool. Nice one, mate sorted this out this was the week before my my d mma debut against adam gorgon so as i'm out there weed's legal isn't it so i'm vegas for the first time in my life and i'm just like no oh, i was like fuck it I'm, I'm i'm having some i'm having some and i had to make weight the next week so i was quite i did drink but i just didn't eat all weekend just thought if i'm gonna put calories in it's just let it be alcohol totally wrong mentality for a fighter like i, I don't know where it comes from that and i'm still like that now but um, I come back and fought Adam Gorgon. Now, he, I knocked him out. You know, he's fought some big names in Bare Knuckle. He was, a, he was, at the time, a big name in BKB. So I had one more fight in MMA, and I realised I don't like this ground. I come up against two strikers, so I was lucky I knocked them both out. But what I loved was, like, as soon as I'd come down to the little gloves. Four rounds. Well, there were, eight, there were eight because it was amateur. Amateur. Yeah. So as soon as I come down to the small gloves and like people were like dropping off jabs and stuff, I thought, because I, I thought I've got power, me. I, I always knew I had power because everyone would say that. But this was when I was seeing it. I was just seeing people like just drop and I'm like, right, this is it. And then when I was getting like, I went to this wrestling club and I got like obliterated by a 14 year old, like just dragged me to the ground. Like I was so disheartening. So I thought, this isn't for me, this. I thought, I'm not going to be able to learn this all, this mixed martial arts. Like, I'm late to the game as it was with, with striking. How am I going to learn wrestling and jujitsu? Stuff what takes years and years and years to master. So I thought, I'm, I'm moving on. And I contacted BKB. They didn't, they didn't get in touch with us for ages. Kept, kept, kept doing it. And then Jack Armfield from Blackpool, he was, he was, he'd been suspended from boxing. So he done a BKB just to get him a, a camp going while he was just suspended. And I begged him. He was getting a phone call while we were on that community service bus. And it was Jim Freeman, one of the owners of BKB. And I was like, and he went, yeah, he wants me. I'm like, me, do me a favor, man. I'm like, come on, get me on there. Get me. So he was like, all right, I'll have a word. Anyway, next minute I got, a, um, I got a opponent who I won't mention his name because I don't want to give him any light, but he's a dickhead. But, um, I was the easy opponent for him. He's just, he's one of, believe it or not, there's a lot of poster boys in BKB. There's a lot who will turn down fights. I'll fight anybody. And they, Franco, these boys, Sean George, Tyler Good John, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, Sweeney, like these boys, it doesn't matter who you are, Ryan Barrett, Daniel Podmore, like these are the cruiserweights, the heavyweight champions and stuff. There's a select few in each division who will fight anybody. But there's also these ones who won't fight anybody. Like, you heard Scott McHugh? No. Oh, man, look into Scott McHugh. Glad from Leeds. Not the greatest of boxing at all, hands down sometimes, but he's just got like, he will just walk forward, boom. <laughs> just Mad cunt. Yeah, oh, man, he's a sick, he's all so entertaining. You've got to be a mad cunt. Got, got to do that fucking bare knuckle to. shit. Everybody I've spoke to, Tyler, Franco, Franco. Uh, I'm going to get Sweeney on, like, they're just animals. But yeah, see, when you speak to them, they're the sweetest fucking people on the planet. You would never think, if you've seen them, you'd think, I could take him. Because and then you see them the train humble. and you think... Loon balls, the humble. Crackers. We don't need to be. Was Tyler not in the fucking pot? He was in a porn game yeah, as well, wasn't so he? Tyler, met, um, so this is how to me and Tyler become mates. So when this, um, <clears throat> when this Channel Five thing come out, so we're at BKB. Now at this point, I'm now stepping into the BKB world. I'm leaving. I'm obviously in Blackpool. I didn't want the BKB lot to know about it. I'd had that much stick. I just couldn't be asked going over it again. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's got to the point where it's. Everyone's forgot about it now in Blackpool and no one's really talking about it. I knew it was going to start off again, but I'd done this sex business program. I didn't know when it was coming out or what. So anyway, it comes out one day, this Friday. My fucking um, phone's blowing up. <laughs> My phone's blowing up, right? And then I had to pull out of the fight. So Why? So <laughs> I got into a bit of road rage, right, with someone and his fault. Obviously, I went to pull out accidentally. And I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, mate. And he's like, like you just didn't look both, both ways sort of thing. 
And he's like, you fucking are. And I was like, what? So anyway, he's in front of us and he's sticking his fingers out like that. He's like, wanker and all this. And I thought, so anyway, I was going left and he was going left as well. And whilst we're driving along the street, it's one where like, all, there's double yellows on one side of the road and everyone parks on the other side. So there's always like only room for like sort of one car. So he drives up to the top and he stops. I've got no way of driving left, right, to get out of here. Gets out of his car, can't reverse and nothing like that. So I get out of the car and I'm like, what? And he's like, you fucking there. I was like, come storming at us. So I just jabbed him and I hit his tooth. That's what that little scar is there. Hit his tooth and it's split open. So by the advice of another fighter, um, he's like, don't tell. Don't tell Jim and Joe. Don't, don't. Like, just just glue it. Get some Gorilla Glue. ex squaddy smudger it was. Right? Another Leeds lad. Legend. <laughs> and he's like, just glue it. I was like, right, cool. Glued it. So I fucking glued it together. And he had this big fucking thing all that. I thought, yeah, we're well, cool. Cool. I told the promoters that I'd hit a bag wrong. And it had gashed open. No one fucking believed it. But I didn't want to tell them I was having fights in the street. So um, I left it anyway. Two days before the fight, honestly, mate. My hand was a balloon. Infected. It was infected, yeah. And I was like, it'll go down, it'll go down. And me, me bird's a nurse at the time. So she's like, Dan, you need to get that look. And I'm like, I'm fucking good, man. I'm not pulling out of this fight. Like, not worse. So especially this opportunity, it was the London or 2 Like, I'm nobody. Jack Armfield had sorted this out for me. Like, I can't pull out of this. It started coming up my, up my arm. Got to about here, like, I went to the hospital. And they were like, if you had left that another day, you could have been losing your arm. So I was like, fuck, so I had to pull out. Like, it was fucking massive. I sent pictures to the promoter. One hand's out here and the other one's just normal. So I had to pull out. But then this, the, the, the fight was on the Saturday. That Friday beforehand, which I think was the 10th of September, 2019, that fucking program come out. So then the next day, Oh, everybody was talking about it. I was at this this BKB. No one was saying anything physically, but I knew they were talking about it. So I had everybody, this this person who I was supposed to be fighting is stupidly homophobic, right? Still to this day, right? Because me and him have got beef, yeah? Because he started putting statuses about this, right? About all of that. And then a few people were getting involved with the banter and I get it, I do get it. It's funny and it's weird. I do get it now, but at the time I was fucking fuming. So I started fucking screaming at the promoter, blah, blah, blah. The promoter was just like, this, he's a fucking dickhead. Fuck me off. Anyway, every time I was like trying to get another fight, I was trying to remake this fight with this guy. And we were trying to get it done. I don't know why it didn't get done, but then anyway, after it didn't get done, he fought somebody else, a journeyman. And then um, I kept texting me, KB. Like, we can't, and they weren't having none of it. I thought they're fucking me off because of this. I thought they're fucking me off because of like this, all this gay puffing. It weren't, it was just this, I don't know. I was just nobody. So I went to another company, um, a, a sort of low level company, Bare Knuckle, and um, up north. And I, I had one fight with them and then COVID kicked. So all through COVID and stuff like that, I was laughed at between the Bare Knuckle community because I was the gay boy. Yeah, I was like that. That's what it was like, and there was there was no way of me proving what I can do. I'd had this one fight who against a bit of a journeyman as well. You can only fight who's put in front of you, can't you? And it was my debut, so I took the fight, fought, beat him in the first round, and then after that, I was like, I was just trying to like, I was just being stopped from being in the bare knuckle community. Put that way, everybody laughing about us. Everybody knew this was the thing. Like, no publicity is bad publicity. So when people are making these memes, these big named fighters are making memes and they're talking about us, you're still talking about us. Mm -hmm. So when I was at this other company, everyone still knew who Dan McGrathen was because how could you not know who Dan McGrathen was? Because he's the one who fucks guys. There's you no know, in it. So how would you not know that's that fucking gay porn star like that was on the TV about it, like all this. So like I say, no publicity, it's bad publicity. So even though people were all in these banter groups taking the piss out of us, you're still talking about us. Just everyone still knows who I am. So then I fought somebody else, right? A guy from Leeds, and I knocked him out in 10 seconds. But if he had won that fight, they were calling me the bare knuckle bummer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's quite funny to be fair. So I see online, I see online the chatting, right? And, and this pickles goes, he's, one of the promoters had said something and this pickles goes, oh yeah, well, I'm going to destroy the bare knuckle bummer. And I'm telling you, it was just lighting fucking fire underneath us. Like, do you know you're not? So anyway, 
I've knocked him out in 10 seconds. One of the first right hands, I threw straight through the middle, just smashed his eye open to pieces. Then I think BKB were like, all right, hang on, but still not saying anything. Mm -hmm. And then I fought somebody else for a European title. This guy who I was telling you about before, who I don't want to mention his name, he then signed for BFBA. So I'm going, give me that fight. Get to the promoter, please give me that fight. Like, we've got beef. This is a marketable fight. Like, he's he's good. Don't get me wrong, he's good. But he hasn't got any balls, yeah? He's, he's, he is good with his hands, but he won't fight anybody on his level. He only wants to fight people below his level, so he wipes through them. Do you know what I mean? He's one of them. He's just got no game about him. So when it comes down to it, I physically messaged him and said, look, are we going to get this fight done or what? And he's like, nah. He's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not doing that anyway. The promoter's like, look, he don't want to fight me. He's like, if he loses to you, it's like, it's, it's bad for his reputation. Da, da, da. And at this point, I thought, this is bullshit. Like, I've just won the European title. He's fighting for the world title, but I'm, so is that me just capped now at the European title for this, for this company? For so is this me capped now? And I thought, I was playing game anyway because I wanted to fight him so much. Like, I, this seriously dislike the guy yeah and he's still now to this day writing gay statuses about us this that i'm not fighting him because he's fucking like, mentioning things like what if i got hiv i mean i was physically getting these all these tests i was getting done i was passing them to the promoter just going just in case just in case anyone because there's a lot of blood involved isn't there mm -hmm. and i knew it would be an excuse for him so i was like just in case so like yeah. he, he was going back and going look mate he's showing us certificates like he's negative on everything he's like oh, it's, it's, i can't mate like and he physically messaged us one day i don't know who of a fighter would do this he said dan stop mentioning my name he said, please he's like fair play you've won blah 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 he went but well, i'm never going to fight you he went the thing is he went what if i lost he went if i lost a fight to you i'd never be able to live it down and i thought who's saying that what sort of fighter physically says to another fighter what if i lost i've what them not because you used to shag guys yeah with like or not but i would be fucking scared to a man who used to shag guys in the street i think there was a film that says shagging girls is for poofs and that was a mad because he was yeah, that yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. nuts remember, he's yeah. like fucking shagging girls is for poofs like, I'm, I'm thinking back in the day that's mad i'm thinking this mad bastard's just fucking doing what he wants i'd be fucking wary but again to be even if somebody was gay and that's saying you don't go oh, if i lost to you that's not a bad no, thing just a, doesn't mean fuck all i've said this over and over like he needs to stop concentrating on what i'm doing out of the ring concentrate what i'm doing in the ring because at the end of the day, I'm a fighter. Every fighter has a fucking hustle. They have to, because you don't make that much money from fighting. Like, eating, sponsors come on board, yeah, money comes and goes, whatever, but you can't not have a side hustle. Whether you have a full-time job, you can have the full-time job, but then you haven't got the time to train freely. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And there's a lot of people, whether it be illegal activities, like drugs, there's a lot of it. Everyone... You become a big draw, though, because of your background and the shit that you've caused. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It got to a point where, like, like I've got a big, not a massive following, but a, a bigger following than, 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 a lot of the, than some the, of the... The bare-knuckle yeah. fighters, they don't get a, a, a big support. It's still a very low organisation it's no, nowhere near well, that's UFC or boxing but potentially in the next five years ten years I don't everybody loves combat sports I, know, I don't see why it can't be as big what were you more nervous at taking drugs through the airport <sighs> bare knuckle first bare knuckle fight or shagging a guy probably shagging a guy for the first time <laughs> yeah it was fucking super like I said it was mentally challenging that bad super super bad there was times in, in an airport once I was going and you know what he fucking tapped me down right Cause he, I went through the machine. He went, "What's that?" And I was, I was pissed because I was used to sitting in them lounges, mate. And I pulled out a packet of fags, and in there was like about four or five grams of MDMA. And he was chatting to his his co-worker like this, and he goes, and he pulls it out, and I swear to God, I must have just started sweating. I was red, and he literally goes. Da 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 da. I was on talking, and I walked through, and even like my mates were like, like that was. That was a close call. That was being somebody looking out for me, you know, quite a lot of times in my life. Like when I said I crashed that car, car and I should have died, like someone's looking out for me up there. Yeah, people are more protected than others in the probably spiritual world. It might seem mad for people, but they are. So what was your world title like? Like, short, like when you go through everything in life from being in the army, being a bit of a loose cannon, kind of 
your stepdad's probably seen the potential and if you screwed the head like you screwed the head you've done well in the DJ and thing you've done well in the gay porn scene like, and now you're flying so whatever you put your mind to you do become yeah. cream of the crop but what was it like getting your world title shot? So like I say they wouldn't give me this fight against the guy who ducks everyone so um, I was like whatever and because I had had drama with BKB promoters in the past I didn't know how this was going to go I still had his number I was fucking buzzing him up I'm like, and I'm thinking this is going to go one way or the other. He's going to hear me out or he's going to say, fuck off. If he said, fuck off, I'm done in bare knuckle. Uh, so that other company, BFBA, that's fucking dog shit. Dog shit company. Nothing com in comparison to to uh, BKB. Like, there's some good fighters on there who are coming from BKB, but it's just because they're, they're getting dropped by BKB or like that guy I'm talking about. He just was turning everyone down. He was a big draw for them, but he was just turning down. Every time you'd get a big name, he'd turn them down. Oh, no, I need an easy fight. So they were just like, they're not about that BKB. They're like, fuck, fuck off. So they got rid of him. He went to this, still couldn't get that fight. Fuck, right, I'm ringing Jim. Rang Jim, spoke to him for a while. And he's like, oh, we'll have you. He's like, water under the bridge, whatever you said in the past, because I went mad. I was quite vocal online. Like, fucking dickheads, da da da. Like, proper going for it, like a, di like a dickhead. And then uh, he goes, oh, water under the bridge, blah, blah, blah. So I get a phone call one day, and he's like, look. I don't want you to think we're doing this because we want you to get beat up. He went, I think this is a good fight. He went, but what, what do you think about Daniel Lowell? Now, I've been a fan of his for years. I've watched Bare Knuckle for a long time. So I um, I watched it and uh, I mean, I took it instantly, obviously. And I'm like jumping up and down in my front garden and my bird's like, what? And I just like showed her, said Jim Freeman. She's like, all oh, right, like that. And I'm like, I'm like walking and I'm going, like that so she's getting what it was and I'm chatting to him for ages and he's going I don't want you to think we're doing this because he's the KO king if you type in Daniel Lowell on YouTube he is a beast mate one of the nicest guys ever does a lot of work for charity like he has his own um, autism charity um, he does all he's such a fucking gentleman like he's I like to have animosity going into fights and I couldn't find anything to, to not like him about nothing I just couldn't so I went in there like liking him so much as a person like once you get in that ring, whatever, it's you or him in there. So um, I get the phone call and I'm like, I'm like, I'll have it. I was like, I'll do it. I had eight weeks. Everybody, everybody ripped me off, apart from a handful of people who I had sparred. So there was a guy called Nathan Leeson who's quite a name. He'd been around BKB for a while. I sparred him and he was shocked. He, because like I say, during during all this time of me not doing nothing all with this other one, I was ridiculed. I was the gay porn star. I was he can't fight. They just assumed I couldn't fight because I don't gay porn. Because it's just not a man thing to do or whatever. Or straight, you know what some people's minds are like. It's just narrow minded people. Some of them, isn't it? They're just not. A lot of them aren't educated on on anything either. So he, um, where was that? Yeah. So yeah, I sparred that leasing and I sparred. Uh, Daniel Podmore who's the heavyweight world champ big shout fucking big pod so I sparred him and he was on an interview once and he said Daniel he went McGrathin and Dan Lowell is going to be a corker he was like everyone's sleeping on McGrathin he went but I wouldn't I said see that guy can fucking fight because me and him sparred we had some good rounds so there was like a handful of people who were backing me how do you spar? Boxing gloves, gloves. gloves. So you got the head guards on as well? It's up to you I don't wear a head guard make it feel as though my head's massive yeah like, so how big are the gloves 12 ounces just, I wear it. if I'm sparring I wear 16 ounce me 16 so just normal ounce. for yeah. bare knuckle yeah yeah and then it as takes you from injuries of course but again for bare knuckle I don't really know how you you yeah, would train it's, with it's it. pointless I know a lot of people do hit the bag bare knuckle but it breaks your skin and then once you get that mark on your knuckle do you know what I mean does it repair it does repair but it takes a long time yeah. so you've got to think every time you make a fist it then rips the scab open like it takes it's not like it hurts it's just irritating because mm -hmm. you've got this cut and then when you put your your hand back in your gloves or your wraps on and then your hands are sweaty and then you can do you know what I mean yeah. it's just not good so a lot of people do do it I don't do it like and I like to wear the 16s because they're heavy the heavy gloves so I feel like when I'm throwing my shots with the gloves off I'm used to holding 16 ounce gloves up your hands are so lighter. now my hands are 16 ounce lighter than mm -hmm. what they usually are so that's why I like doing it but we sparred we had a good fucking spar and he was like saying look he was one of the only people hand, like I say a handful of people who had me winning that fight um, and then I went into the fight like I say the whole 
some people were messaging the BKB page saying, why the hell are you, are you doing this fight to make McGrath and get beat up? You must be because this is such a mismatch. And I was taking that by the balls, mate. I was like, you're not, um, this is what lit that fire. Yeah, you, you think I'm not going to be capable of this. All right, sound, watch. Mm -hmm. So I went in there and I don't know if you've seen the fight, but I fucked him up with me jab in the first round. No one's done that to their well. Nobody. Nobody has done that to them. He snoozed everybody, land, lands on them, and they were asleep. Do you know what I mean? We, I hit him with a jab. He come stepped in, stepped in orange, tapped perfectly timed jab, dropped him within eight seconds, jumped back up. I seen this little cut under his eye. Thought, right, okay, I'm going to work that cut. So I kept working the cut. He come on the inside. He likes to get on the inside a bit. We had a little bit of a scrap on the inside, and I caught him with a short uppercut, put him down again. At this point, I thought, I'm winning on the outside and I'm winning on the inside. I thought, you're not. And I looked over at him because he kept posting online. I felt, I didn't really brag about the fight afterwards, which I usually do. Because you had respect for him. Yeah, also I was a dickhead afterwards. I'm not usually like that when I win a fight, but like he kept saying online leading up to the fight, it only takes one. It only takes one. He's a big hitter. And I kept thinking, I know it only takes one, but what makes you think your one's better than my one? Mm -hmm. like if that was so I looked over to him after the second lockdown and went it only takes one and I watched it back and I what a dickhead and then anyway when I stopped him about a couple of seconds after that I jump up on, on the ropes I'm fucking rah, and I watched it back and I didn't like how I acted but that's probably just a release of all the brilliant that you got yeah. the fucking it was, a, the, it was a fuck you to the whole arena the people it was against you and that's what it was just for thinking that you've done a bit of fucking gay porn all of a sudden you can't fight you're weak you're soft you can't do this so this is just probably a release of told you so all the years yeah. of bullying all the years of thinking you're not good enough going off the rails because let's face it anybody that drinks or takes gear and I'll say this a lot of people don't agree but you're always escaping the person who you don't want to face because we're all scared and every fighter I've interviewed what I've realised now is they all fight because they're scared Mm. a lot of them love it but it's because they were fearful at one point in their life yeah. where yeah, they were bullied yeah, yeah. Or most fighters would be bullied aren't they, yeah. aren't they? it's a mad connection and I think that's why I think that's why a lot of fighters are humble I don't, you don't need to prove that you're a hard cunt you don't have to do that Like, and that's why you get people on the streets who like wow they can't fucking fight yeah. for shit. Right but heads just and that. rah, rah, rah. Yeah. It's intimidation to make people think. It's just a print intimidation to try and keep them away from not even yeah. fighting. How do you feel about talking about your life today? Good. Good. I've won, like I said, I've manifested this. I've, mm -hmm. I've knew I was going to tell this story for a while. Like even when, see all them who ridicule us and that. Nobody talks about the straight porn though. No, but now I'm doing straight porn. Yeah. Nobody's shouting out about that. I'll tell you what I have got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of. Oh, I would do that. How do you get into that? Hmm. Go and fucking shag a geezer for five years and work your way up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I see. I see, I started at fucking gay porn and I worked my way up. The reason why Rebecca Moore contacted me, because mm -hmm. she's a star. She, she's a star. She's a porn star, yeah. Like a, a gigantic star worldwide. Her and Sophie Anderson were massive. So she contacted us. She seen me on Channel 5 and she's like, if he can do because do you know Danny D? Yeah. Brazzers. He started in gay porn. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? He's got a fucking twelve he, inch deck or something. Yeah, yeah, ten inch, yeah, massive. I mean, chill, not, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well fucking like, wee balls. He, he started in gay porn under the name Matthews. Yeah. So it was a lot harder for him because the stigma behind gay porn back then mm -hmm. when he started was a lot harder, but then he drifted into porn uh, gay, straight porn, sorry, and now he's a straight porn the man he's the guy in straight yeah, porn yeah. so she seen that and she's like if he's willing to do gay porn he's willing to do anything so she's like contact us through twitter she's like can i do have you for this scene blah 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 it had been a long time since the cock destroyers had done anything because it's been um covid so they weren't doing anything this was their first scene back in this time sophie's got a boyfriend so anyway it was a scooby-doo scene i sent you the picture <laughs> where i'm fred and they're daphne and velma so i'd done this scene and do you know what i didn't want to tell anybody that i was doing straight porn because Why? i felt like it was me a cover up justifying the gay porn and now having it i used to when i was in the in the rave scene i had a bad ego about it when i was grafting drugs i had a fucking bad ego and i'm not ashamed to say it like i didn't i thought i was some fucking boy when i weren't so now i felt if I go around to people going, 
I've done straight porn, I've done straight porn. It's my ego coming out of it again, trying to justify the gay porn. Like now, do you know what I mean? So I just didn't tell anybody about it. Um, me, me bird, for example, like when we first were doing the gay porn, she was saying she wouldn't be happy if it was straight porn, blah, 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 because she's on that documentary, the Channel 5 one, same girl. And she's going, oh, if it was straight porn. But then as we got into the scene more, like Tyler got with Alessa, she was a big porn star. Tyler got himself into porn again. Like I said, Tyler, he he was one of the only BKB boys when the gay porn thing documentary come up. He was the only one who was supportive. He shared it. He was like, yes, Dan, you fucking legend. Like everybody else was, and he was like, I don't give a fuck. He was like, that guy's a sick guy. Like, and I, I respect fuck, that. Yeah, I Tyler's a fucking that. legend. He's See, anybody that's got your back, mate, whenever the cunt's against you, mate, that's the ones you want in your life yeah. forever. Well, me and Tyler because there's not many like who do since. it, especially if everybody speaking out about it, because people support what's popular. Yeah. So if it's popular to hate somebody because of what they're doing, people will jump on it. And people, when you become successful, only jump on it when it becomes popular. Tyler didn't care. Do you know what I mean? And that's why I've got a lot of respect for him. That's why I've got a lot of respect for Sweeney and Franco, because yeah. they're just fucking good people. What's the, what's the difference? Obviously, you're shagging a guy in a bird that's fucking different, but is the feeling different, or has it just become a job where you're numb to it? It's still the same. Like, you've still got to, like, you've got to be wary where the camera is. You've still mm -hmm. got to perform. You're not going to be able... Because I worked at such a high level, she knew that I was... A performer she there's a difference between just you could just have a big dick you can have all the attributes but if you can't perform you're fucking dog shit you have to be able to perform you have to be able to come like when the scene's finished everybody wants to get home they don't want to sit around for five hours while you're like oh i can't come i can't come do you know what i mean there is ways to do fake come there is like tricks of the trade but nobody wants that like so if you can if you can come in stop start is a big thing a lot of people don't like stop starting now obviously i'm not using the trimix because you're with the buds well I, well did i get to the the story about no i didn't injecting yeah 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 you've done that with the guys yeah yeah yeah, yeah but the, the last ever gay scene i've done the guy who injected us with it see i'm drifting off constant the guy who injected us with it he shouldn't have been doing it and he was a bit of a fruitcake He's the guy who owned the company, but he wanted everybody to have super hard dicks. So there was no fucking about. There was no like, oh, none of this. And I can't do this. I can't do that. He just wanted it done. Well, so there's an antidote. So the, you, you have little tiny bit, two IU, yeah? Little insulin needle in the base of the dick. Bang, right? And when you finish, you have this antidote. And it's about a mil, right? About a mil, maybe more. So quite a lot, a <laughs> lot different, yeah? You put that in. If you're still hard, it'll bring you down. Because, mate, it's like... <laughs> It's like a heartbeat in your awesome. dick. All the blood is rushed to your dick. Like, you just feel like it's going to explode at some point. So it's not good to have it up for a long time. So anyway, I'm like, can, I, can you bring me down? He's like, yeah. But like I said, the guy's on Adderall and like he's, he's fucking like this all the time. He's a bit of a fruitcake. Super successful, like, but just a bit of a fucking loon. He mixed the bottles up. So he gave me a fucking... He gave me a lethal dose of Trimix. So rather than have an antidote, he gave me a fucking mill of Trimix. So I'm like, this, this is getting worse. I'm like, this is so, mate. And he's like, ah, you be good. Go and have a cold shower. Go for a run. Get the blood flowing around your body and that. I'm like, all right, what the fucking hardest dick you can think of. And I'm running around. Was it, this was Barcelona, this, in the fucking hills. So I'm running around like big hard on in in Barcelona trying and I'm come back and I'm like mate it's been an hour now I'm like it's not coming down and then he's went in his thing and he's like and I just see his face go red and he starts shaking he's like fuck and I'm like what and he's on the phone to his doctor and he's like uh, uh and he's Russian so he starts speaking Russian to this doctor and I'm, I'm like what's going on and then the manager guy's like go and stand up I'm, I'm not standing fucking nowhere realized he, what you've done I thought fuck and I was hard for about eight nine hours so because you can't give me too much of the antidote at once I've had way too much trimix to the point you're probably going to need 10 20 mil of the antidote to get it down but you can't give me that much in one because that much liquid going into your dick is it's fucking ridiculous you'll end up like with lumps or whatever it, it can be bad and honestly I thought I was going to lose my dick so after about like every Every hour, every 90 minutes, he'd come and he'd give me another mill and I'd have to like massage it and it, nothing was happening, mate. Nothing was happening and eventually it started to go down. Um, and after that, I was in contract with him then. And after that, I texted him when I got home and I was like, look, he's one of them because he's quite disliked in the industry because he's a knob. He doesn't like talking through text because screenshots are so easy. So um, I messaged him and I said, look, 
I want out my contract. I said, with everything what happened in in Barcelona, I think it's only fair you let me out my contract. And he was like, just text back, released. I was like, gone, I'm done. And that was the last time I worked for them. Gay, that was 2019. I've done OnlyFans since. I mean, I've fucking thrived on OnlyFans since. Like, once I realised that's my income now is OnlyFans and without it, and I couldn't give a fuck what anyone has to say about how I make my money because I'm fucking doing well. You do all I think right. You've got to have that mentality though in that industry. You've got to not. I mean, give I'm a not fuck. rich. I'm not rich by the slightest. By. But I don't have to work. Yeah. I can train every day. I've moved to Wigan, so I moved from Blackpool to Wigan. I got a house in Wigan. I moved there. I, I live five minutes away from my kids. I pick my kids up from school. Like I said, I missed a little bit while I was in Blackpool. Couldn't do anything. Now I'm picking my kids up from school three times a week. They're staying at mine on the weekends. My daughter's at that age where if she wants to just ring and go, Daddy, can I come to yours? I'm like, yeah, I'll come get you, yeah. whatever. So you've got a bit of structure in your life? I'm, I'm buzzing yeah. now. So when's your next fight? September, I hear? September 3rd, yeah. Um, Who are you fighting and where's this? London or two defending my world title first events against a French dude from King of the Streets. Have you seen that King yeah, of the Streets? Not Casey's rich. <laughs> I don't want to treat <laughs> you. Yeah, it's good that there's a there's a set of rules in yeah, that yeah. ring because that King of the Streets is brutal. There's a guy who fights for BKB called Eric Olsen, American dude. He fights for King of the Streets, man. He's just won his last fight by eye gouge. Yeah. He's got put his thumb in the eye. That's how he won the fight. The guy was, I've never heard a grown man scream like that. Yeah, fuck that, brother. So how are you feeling today then after <sighs> releasing? I'm fine, feeling good. Honestly. Yeah, well, yeah. a bigger audience where people realise. I've been excited to get on Just to tell your story and you've been through a mad journey. It's yeah. not what, it's not many people been through that life, mate, from the gay porn to the army to prisons to fucking then but world, no world champion, bare knuckle. No one in bare knuckle can say anything. But do you feel as if you're constantly trying to yeah. prove to others? Yeah. Especially the fighters, the BKB fighters. How does it make you feel when people are homophobic against you knowing that your brother's gay? Does that upset you as well? Does that fuel your fire it's a bit? The fucking world, isn't it, mate? And like I said, these people who are, who are homophobic, it's because they dislike their own life. That guy I'm telling you about who I was supposed to fight on BKB, um, who now fights for the other company, he is so homophobic. He's still putting gay statuses about me. When I win a fight, he'll be like because I fucking mentioned him stupidly in a post fight interview I don't know why my adrenaline James fuck after winning that fight because like I said it was a big fuck you to everybody so I went and done my post fight interview I was flying and I'm chatting to the guy and I said it was talking about opportunities and I said and I looked at the camera and I was like because that's what happens I said his name so when you take fights I said if you take fights things like this can happen I had my belt and everything I was like this is what because he would never take them sort of fights he was turning all these people down so I was like and I went mad and then he put a status saying oh the fucking gay boy still mentioning my name blah 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 he's so homophobic that I'm telling you now like he he's he's fucking gay and the guy is a prolific woman beater like he's been in jail for beating up women like he put a citizen i'll never fight this guy because because of his job i get no glory in beating a guy like that but he gets glory beating up journeymen who have never won a fight or women like it did mean there was an article about him about him battering his ex bird and it was fucking harrowing to read mate it was it was horrible and i thought everybody within the in, in the scene knows what he's like now so it's just like they're just fucking ignoring but he'll never fight it if he's got a problem fight me then because that's what we do is fighting men don't you if you've got beef with someone he's the only person on the fucking planet i've got beef with now yeah so if you've got beef with someone settle it considering we're both professional bare knuckle fighters and well, that's not settling in the ring but he knows because he's watched it he knows he doesn't win that fight. He knows he doesn't win that fight. So, how do you move forward from here, then, brother? What's uh, the plans for the future? Still keep doing porn when I'm booked. Like I say, I'm getting booked a lot for straight porn these days. Um, Would you ever is, go back to gay porn? Probably not. No, the money was right. Big offer. If the money was right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the money was right. Yeah, but I, I did, like I say, I don't think I could <clears throat> now inject myself with that that stuff. I think I'd lose the plot because mm -hmm. that like that would mentally drain us. So with the gay porn, I mean with the straight porn 
it's fucking a hell of a lot easier, obviously. It's still not sex. So this is why, like, my girlfriend's all right with it now. Since Tyler got into the scene, he was with, he was with Alessa. He's saying, like, look, he was with a porn star. He's saying to people, look, it's not what you think. Porn, once them cameras are running, it's not passionate. You're going to act passionate, but as soon as it says cut, you're back to fucking me and you chatting like this. Some yeah. of them have got husbands. Some of them have got, do you know what I mean? Like the, the one of the girls I work with, she's got a husband, like, and they're like that, but she's a porn star. Like mm. it's, it's work. It, it's not. Yeah. So she adjusted to that. We've done the, we've done a couple of straight porn scenes and now she books me all the time. I've got another book in on the 7th of October for straight. But until then, it's just, I market myself to the gay market. Because they're the ones who subscribe to my OnlyFans. It's business, mate, isn't it? I only have to have a, a shower. I'll have a wank in the shower. I'll, I'll put, my, put my phone up, record, I'll wash myself, I'll fucking play with myself, I'll be like, hey, helicopter, whatever. Do you know what I mean? And I'll just post that up. And people are subscribing 10 of a month. What is all your social media links? Put Plug them in the news. So well. Instagram is uh, Dan McGraffin. My OnlyFans is Dan McGraffin. Um, onlyfans.com forward slash Dan McGraffin. Um, I have bought a URL to that and linked it up, which is danmcgraffin.co.uk, um, which is just going to take you straight to my OnlyFans. That's if you want to watch it. If you don't, some some nosy people just go and have a look. But crack on, it all goes in my bank at Fucking the end of the money, day. Mate, <laughs> Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Yeah, me fight. Tune into me fight. 3rd of September, the London O2 against some crazy undefeated international king of the streets dude, which is going to be fireworks. Like, that's my next thing. Good on you, bro. Listen, yeah, man, nice for coming one. on today and telling your story. Thank you. I wish you all the best for the future. Good luck with your fight and keep smashing it, brother. That's it. Nice one, mate. Yeah.